basically along the caravan routes. The maritime silk road concept came out after the colonial period when many scholars post in the post-colonial years started questioning the Eurocentric approach to the trade that was going on in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, these papers, this morning and this afternoon, will discuss uh, this uh, trading from the viewpoint of what was going on in Southeast Asia. Um, you, if you are familiar with the, the idea of the Maritime Silk Road, uh, it started to appear in the in the 60s and 70s, and uh, it went asunder the colonial narrative that uh, it was the Portuguese and the Spaniards that started all the Southeast and, and the Dutch that started all this uh, trading in Southeast Asia. In fact, uh, the Maritime Silk Road will, uh, uh, concept shows that even before the colonial powers came to Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia was very vibrant with trade. And the papers this morning will talk about the location of the Philippines in that trade. We have Dr. John Peterson, who will talk on always at the, at the edge of the of empires, the Philippines in world trade in the early modern period, where he will show where the Philippines was in the whole discussion of the Srivijaya, Majapahit, and of, of the trading that, that emerged after these empires uh, collapsed. We also have from Australia, uh, Dr. Peterson, by the way, is an archaeologist and he will be introduced by uh, uh, Regina later. Uh, we have from Australia an independent researcher, my good friend, Genesis Veles, who is finishing, uh, completing his dissertation, doctoral uh, work. He will talk on uh, why the, uh, where Cebu figures or where the Visayas figures into the maritime trade and why it, it doesn't appear. Know, in, in in the in from the song to the Atang song to the Yuan period, and he will look at because he can read Chinese or Mandarin. He will he has uh, looked at Chinese records to see where Cebu and the rest of the Visayas begin to appear. The third paper is uh, my presentation. It will be a discussion on archaeological excavations conducted in downtown Cebu City as well as in in uh, yeah in downtown Cebu City to look at the uh, primacy of Humabon's port of Subo and whether it figured in directly in the maritime trade with the Chinese or whether there was an indirect trading as Dr. Peterson and uh, Genesis Mr. Veles will uh, posit this morning. The final paper, not the least of course, is by Dr. Earl Jude Cleope, Vice President for Academic Affairs at Silliman University and a historian. He will talk on the archaeological excavations that were conducted by Silliman University in the 70s and in the 80s. I hope you will join us and continue to stay with us in this whole event. This is the University of San Carlos panel session eight. Thank you, Reg. Thank you very much, Sir Jobbers. We hope that all of you will be able to join us once again in the afternoon uh, for the uh, second panel of this session. At this point, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our two distinguished speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. John Allen Peterson. Dr. Peterson is an anthropological archaeologist specializing in historical ecology and landscape studies. He has worked in the American Southwest, Texas, Northern Mexico, China, Congo Brazzaville, Ecuador, and currently in the Philippines. In the Philippines, he has conducted community archaeology programs through the University of San Carlos Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and History Community Mapping and Heritage Preservation Program, and has worked extensively on heritage programs with the freely associated states of Micronesia in Pompeii, Yap, the Marianas, and also in Guam. He has served on the State of Texas State Board of Review, the State of Hawaii Historic Preservation Board, the Guam Historical Preservation Board, and landmark commissions in San Elizario, El Paso, and Socorro, Texas. 
Peterson is currently the president of the International Committee of Archaeological Heritage Management, a scientific committee of ICOMOS in support of the World Heritage Program. He is a visiting professor at the University of San Carlos and an affiliate faculty with the Department of Anthropology, University of Hawaii, and editor of the Philippine Quarterly of Culture and Society. Our second speaker is Dr. Genesis Veles. Dr. Veles is originally from Cebu, Philippines. He finished his Bachelor of Arts major in philosophy in 1997 at Christ the King Mission Seminary in Quezon City and master's degree in theology in 2004 at the Philosophische Theologische Hochschule St. Augustine in Germany. He learned both Mandarin and classical Chinese during a two-year intensive language course at Furen University in Taipei, Taiwan, between 2006 and 2008. He then attended the PhD program in Sinology at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany, under the supervision of Professor Roderick Tak, a renowned scholar on Chinese maritime history. From 2005 to 2011, he was a research assistant at Monumenta Serica, a Sinological Research Institute of the Society of the Divine Word, SVD, in Germany. In 20, the School of Business and Economics at the University of San Carlos, he organized a special Chinese course for SBE professors and instructors. Afterwards, he migrated to Australia, earning his master's degree in social work from Flinders University in 2016. Since then, he has been involved in the social services sector in paid and volunteer roles. Although he is no longer in the academe, he still works on an ambitious and lifelong project, doing an annotated translation of Zong Zhu Bu Ji Zong, Yu Guan Fei Lu Bin, Ziyao Yu Bian, or the collection of historical materials on the Philippines in Chinese classical books. And now, without further ado, here is a pre-recorded presentation of Dr. John Allen Peterson of his paper titled, Always at the Edge of Empires, the Philippines in World Trade during the Early Modern Period. The Philippines was already participating in global trade in the 15th and 16th centuries before Magellan made his fateful landing in Limusawa and Cebu in 1521. Asian export pottery is found in abundance at sites in the region from the Song Dynasty, 960 CE, and it was carried into the hinterland as well as accumulating in dense middens in the coasts. The bulk of trade was brokered by Moro pilots and by the sultanates of Brunei and Cebu. By the 16th and 17th centuries, Spanish practices of encomendero and reducción were largely unsuccessful in disrupting traditional exchange and transhumance patterns. But the Spanish Empire did dos dislocate trade for the Sultanates and replaced it with Asian connections through Manila. By the 17th and 18th centuries, captives from the Visayas were exchanged through trading ports in Makas Makassar and in Malacca by Taosug and Iranian raiders, who traded them downstream through British and Dutch parties, thereby fighting a proxy war with the Spanish in the southern Philippines. Raiding and trading items for the Maritime Silk Road was indirect and down the line from the Philippines, and the edge of exchange was in the zone of conflict south of the Visayas. On the other hand, exchange through the galleon trade in the late 16th century with China and New Spain through Manila was robust and likely replaced direct trade brokered through the Sultanates after Spanish intrusion into the region. Throughout much of this long durée, the Philippines remained at the edge of empires, remote and fiercely resistant until Spain co-opted native resistance through the same mechanisms that were effective in New Spain, the Mission, the Presidio, and the Hacienda. The Philippines is a social construction made up of more diversity than unity and more far-flung islands loosely connected by kinship and language groups than by central places and hierarchies. Those have emerged as a consequence of commerce and empire and colonialization rather than organically from the Filipino landscape and a native imaginary. What the Spanish recognized as a unified place was not perceived in the same way by native Visayans and Lumads, Moros, and Tagalogs, who had a broad concept of their own places and landscapes, but only vaguely recognized an expanded polity of the Philippines. 
The Spanish encountered a fragmented pastiche of cultures and languages and strived mightily to join it all together into something they could manage. What they found also was that the archipelago had never been aligned or politically allied with any outside polity or people. There had been penetration. Srivi giants had perhaps been trading in the middle of the first millennium. By the 10th century, Majapahit boats were hauling rice from Java to Butuan and other places down the line. By the 14th century, the Moro traders from the Sultanate of Brunei were actively visiting the Filipinos in loosely structured communities in Mindoro and Manila and Panay and Cebu and Bohol, and leaving behind porcelain and silk in exchange for forest products and dried tripang. But there was no central place, no central polity, and no so-called entrepot until the Moro traders in the south and west and the Spanish from the north imposed them on the realm. Any other trading had been down the line from the Moluccas outward with spices, an exchange that grew in the colonial era as cloves were highly prized in Europe for meat preservation, and cinnamon, nutmeg, sandalwood, etc., were unique products of the region. They had moved through the region prior to European advent and were mentioned in shipping bills of lading in Guangzhou before the 16th century. And Ternate did become a source of cloves to outside traders in the southern commercial zone. As Rodney Patak concluded, how did cloves reach Sung, China? Some sources on pre-Sung and Sung maritime trade mention the Moluccas but are silent about direct connections between China and these of the other outer, uh, Eastern Indonesian areas. Nor is there any evidence of East Indonesians living among the foreign communities in China's ports. Hence, it appears that Java, Srivijaya, Champa, and perhaps Butuan on Mindanao, if Butuan is really Butuan, functioned as the chief re-exporters of cloves to the Far East. The first two places and Butuan probably had the most direct access to the Moluccas, while Champa probably received its clove through the Indonesians themselves or through the foreign community resident on its shores. However, there is no clear evidence pointing to direct connections between Champa and Eastern Indonesia, nor can I find any written statement on Philippine merchants sailing to the North Moluccas. All this might imply two things. Comparably, few ships sailed through the Celebes Sea and if consignments of cloves passed through uh, this area, they were likely to change hands in, in, in Butuan before reaching Champa or China. However, in view of Srivijaya's and Java's commercial influence, most cloves arriving in Sung, China probably left the Moluccas by way of Java. Traders were contact, uh, contacting collection centers in the Moluccas and possibly in Butuan, but elsewhere it may have been more sporadic. Were there centers for trade? Pigafetta notes the extended settlement for seven leagues along the shore in central Cebu without any indication of a primary or central settlement. Certainly it wasn't marked by monumental architecture, and even the Datu house was probably as modest as all the others. The chiefly palisade wall around the Datu's house in Tanhai Negros, found in an archaeological excavation, was the same dimension as the typical Visita compound, and was likely from the early church rather than any chiefly center. The Spanish appear to have created the same central places in the Philippines, while the locals relied on networks and dispersed places. <clears throat> the Spanish didn't first explore the interior of Cebu, but remarked that locals were hard to keep on the missions. The native inhabitants would perhaps attend the mass, but disappeared into the hills to their highland residences. Perhaps they occupied stilt balai along the shore when visiting the coast for fishing, much as the residents of Dalaget are known to have done from historical records. A study of pottery and constituent elements uh, using ICPMS technology was done to examine patterns at the Saluk Church in Valladolid. Earthenware pottery was found on the floor of the church during excavation. It was compared with earthenware from a Neolithic site in Karkar and Kamasuhan in the highlands, as well as with modern traditional pottery made in Sibonga and with a clay source next to the Saluk site in Valladolid, known to have been used by the, in the Sibonga potters. The clay also underlay the walls of the church, and radiocarbon dating of the clay and the soils determined the clay to have formed from about 1,000 to 1,200 AD. The modern pots matched the clay, but none of the other pottery had used that source. The Neolithic pottery was made 1,000 years before the clay formed. The Highland pottery was made from a source adjacent to the church, was not made from a source adjacent to the church, suggesting that the permanent residence was in the hills and that the Saluk site was only occasionally occupied. Sherds from Bohol, from across the Bohol Strait, interestingly, did match the Tuyum source, suggesting cross-strait interchanges may have been stronger than interior coastal interaction. 
In any case, lack of local pottery suggests that the reduction did not work, at least in the early years of the missions of the era 1599 to 1622, during the short life of the parish. Many sites in the eastern coast of Cebu have abundant Asian porcelain, export porcelain on the ground surface mixed with local earthenware sherds. Was this a commercial exchange from as early as the 10th century when Song Dynasty Celadon can be found on some sites? And was it an indication of a commercial entrepot in the 15th to 17th centuries? Aside from debris found abandoned in excavations, it also appears with burials from the period such as in Bohol. The pottery was evidently valued, but what was the character of the relationship to the pottery? As Arhun Apaterai asked about the social life of things. Robert Fox noted that the clear ringing tone of porcelain ceramics from China, along with its pleasing appearance, made it an invaluable ritual element. The dance around the altar, first one direction for seven rounds, then the opposite, was accompanied by brass gongs and porcelain tinklers in a mesmerizing tonal celebration. Fox suggested that the value of the pottery was for this ritual accompaniment rather than for commercial exchange. Chiefly dispensation would not have captured the artifacts in an exchange network. Rather, it was a participatory network in the ritual life of the community. Fay Cooper Cole documented these rituals from the 1890s in Bukitnon, and Emerson Christie describes the rituals among the Subana. We witnessed these same performances in Zamboanga only a few years ago. The porcelain is secreted below the house when not being used in the ritual. It is not for sale. There is considerable longevity to these cultural patterns, at least known to outsiders for the past 350 years when Alcina described them in Samar and more recently over 100 years ago in Mindanao by Cole. Given the continuity of material culture in burials and hilltop ceremonial sites, they appear to have been practiced for at least the past 2,000 years. The hilltop Alionar site in Kanya near Karkar was first excavated by Rosa Tenasis in the 1970s. A retired vet who had married into family in Napo found basalt adzes and earthenware pottery on the ridge tops around Napo on a ridge called Tingiz locally. He attended one of Rosa's courses at the University of San Carlos and then introduced her to the sites. Rosa found an infant burial under some stones, much broken debris from small jars, and juvenile pig bone. She interpreted it as a Neolithic period ritual site, noting the burial as a significant element. We revisited the site in 2005 and confirmed her findings along with radiocarbon age from about 2,000 years ago from charcoal in a rock feature. We had just attended the Black Friday Subanan ceremony in Tangu, and were astonished at the similarity in setting and material culture, and the absence of any residential features on the small hilltop site. It was a powerful observation site for celestial events and patterns, with a panoramic view to the eastern sky. <coughs> Recently, we found what we believe is another of these sites in uh, the Quintarian Hill near San Remigio, Cebu. The hill is in a similar setting with a commanding view of the northeastern sky, as well as the shoreline and valley where San Remigio is located. The hilltop has several cobble alignments crossing the crown of the hill in parallel lines and a small mound of cobbles at the center of the hill. The debris from many small broken earthenware jars is scattered among the rock alignments as well as on the hill slope climbing to the hilltop. There are no residential features and the alignments are not similar to terrace walls on the lower slopes built to retain soil for corn and other crops. If there is any kind of central place in the Visayan landscape, it would be these ritual foci where Orion could be viewed rising in the evening sky or solar events could be commemorated. Notably, there are a few 15th to 17th century porcelain sherds found at the archeological sites along the coast that we documented in our first field season of the North Cebu Archeological Project. Burials excavated at the San Nepomuceno Church and at nearby La Piajan are from the Metal Age, or 500 to 700 BC, and or CE, excuse me, and the grave goods are locally made earthenware jars, some used for cremated remains. Notably among the grave goods is a very unique ceramic disc in the form of a linglingo, found on the chest of a burial that was found in the 2011 excavation season. Two more large ceramic discs were found in the 2021 season without the distinctive linglingo shape. Another is documented in a collection of Manila found at the Gigantes Island near Panay, a straight shot from San Remigio across the Visayan Sea. Were these markers of cultural identity or of ritual alliance? It appears to be a sign of a shared culture in this region. It denotes the linkages of peoples among islands in a maritime network. The central places don't appear to be entrepreneurial, and another kind of power site, perhaps linked to the observation hills 
that may be scattered widely throughout the region. No one has ever really thought to look for them until now. From the outside looking in, these sites were probably not recognized by the Spanish. They are impermanent sites on permanent landscape features, rickety wooden frames with a platform surrounding roasted juvenile pigs, small earthenware jars holding the guardiente or possibly tuba, boiled eggs and other meats, all of these decaying rapidly in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the atmosphere. Only the pig bones and broken jars survive. Unless seen in action, they would not have been perceived as places of power. Rather, the Spanish eyed these locations as Ilihan or defensive refugia sites, if seen at all. From the inside facing out, however, these sites must have been central, secret places in the landscape that linked networks of people in kinship and language families in, in the locality, but also regionally in a shared tradition. There appears to have been a shared Neolithic tradition throughout the Philippines from the earliest known sites, roughly five to 6,000 years ago, with some perhaps earlier, but the material culture is simple and expedient. Earthenware pottery with some decorated pieces with indented designs, such as the Orion butterfly design from the Alionar site. Now, occasionally, chert flake tools and expended cores are found in the sites. Crude, but it is thought that bamboo was a far more abundant material for arrow tips than chert and far easier to work. But no red slip pottery until 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. And these appear to have been a fugitive slip without a durable finish. It is generally eroded. Later in the so-called Iron Age, circa 2,500 to 1,500 years ago, a higher quality finish appears in vessels used as funerary urns and caves. Bill Solheim called these the Colonai type and linked it to traditions in mainland Southeast Asia with nearly identical treatment morphology, durable red slipping, and occasional indented or incised decorations, sometimes in elaborate swirls around the shoulder and body of the vessel. This style appears rapidly in the region, but the general Neolithic tradition described above appears to have been persistent throughout the region alongside this new phenomenon. Were these different people living in coeval landscapes with different identities? Lorena and others found that the earliest mainland people to arrive in the Philippines entered through the Northern Cordillera, Cordillera around 8,000 years ago and groups with different genomic origins, but distantly related, continued to appear throughout the archipelago and are linked from the north to burials in Surigao. Coastal maritime peoples may have traveled widely and quickly through the region, using the highly mobile prahu that sea nomads still use among the Mokan and the Bajau. But even peoples mainly living on land could have roamed the length of the archipelago during several periods of land bridges as frequent in the region as every 100,000 years or less. So the earliest known Homo erectus hominids posited for the Kalinga site or the Arubo site in Nuevo Nuevo easily transited the region. Later, people so far included in the ADNA studies indicate distinctive populations, but with some common genomic connections. In any case, they do appear to share many common if somewhat generalized cultural features throughout the region and through the long durée but they were never apparently joined in an archipelago-wide identity as ancient Filipinos. It was left to the Spanish and others, other outsiders to reify indigenous populations into rationalizable groups like Visayans or Igorots. Only later were the differences in language and culture and genomes realized. We now have trade records that mention cargoes entering and departing Guangzhou that record the scale of trade to and from the region. They show a changing trend from the south through Indonesia specifically Makassar, Java, and Sulawesi, that traded east into the Malaccas and to Butuan. This may have been down the line through the region and transferred in Malacca. This shifted in the 15th, 14th and 15th centuries to trade through the north, transiting Brunei and the Sultanate, and taking advantage of places in Mindoro, Luzon, and Palawan, as well as possibly Cebu, where Muslim pilots driving Chinese junks made ports of call to exchange silks, porcelains, and stoneware with possible comestibles like rice in the containers. They received dried trepang, hardwood, needed partly as ballast for the return voyage, bird's nests, shark fins, and damar for caulking, and other forest and marine products. It was a routine trade, perhaps uh, annually through most of the regions, but did not create trading centers, so far as we know, that were central places in the native mine. They were occasional or conditional locations with good anchorage, protection from storms, and access to sufficient population from among the scattered villages and residences along the coasts and in the highlands. 
They do not appear to have grown into formal courts with improvements and permanence. They were persistent places, in the words of Sarah Slanger, but not improved ports. These were not to be developed until Spanish settlers built harbors, forts, churches, and roads along the shore. Then they became central places for trade and hierarchical and stratified governments. Nonetheless, it appears that the native places persisted in the shadow of urbanization, and Europeanization has scattered on focused villages and belie along the coast and scattered throughout the highlands. These connections were the first contacts by an external global network and were selective and few at the beginning. But by the 15th century, when Muslim culture proliferated in the region, the Philippines rapidly entered world culture, albeit with a Middle Eastern flavor. Within a century of this earliest world contact, Portuguese merchants entered the region from the West. And a few decades later, the Spanish expedition of Magellan introduced a Western Christian colony in the Philippines that was to be fully exercised after 1565 with the arrival of Nagaski. They soon moved to Manila, lacking sufficient food in the Cebu area, and displaced a nascent Muslim community established by the Brunei Sultanate and more cordially sponsored a Chinese Parian community as trading partners in the region. The ultimate Portuguese goal was the spice trade, while the thrust of Spanish trade was direct connection with China and its ceramic, silk, and stoneware heritage. Ultimately, through the Manila Galleon, Manila became the nexus for exchange of silver from the New World for China's production. This pattern of cultural invisibility continued throughout all of the known history of the colonial encounter. In the age of the occasional junk laden with porcelain, perhaps as early as the Tang or surely the Song dynasty, a few foreign artifacts accumulated sites from these periods. By the Yuan period in the 14th century, greater stability and support of commerce, the Mongol usurpers led to regularity and increase in trade routes, switching to the northern reach of the Philippines. In the 16th century, Spanish settlement and the establishment of the galleon trade even more regularized this commercial network. Our excavations at the Jesuit house in the Parion district of Cebu City shows that there was robust exchange from the late 15th and early 16th century that rapidly grew in the late 16th century in volume and diversity of materials to include stonewares from mainland Southeast Asia and late Ming Dynasty Wanli period ceramics, as well as a novel high-fired ceramic with stamped designs that could be something similar to Manila ware or possibly ceramics imported from Myanmar, as uh, thinks possibly John Mixick. This period of interaction among foreign and indigenous cultures also had evidence of native cultures like fish corrals alongside the edge of the late of the sea, late 15th century remains of the now ex extirpated native tamarau, and chicken bone and fighting implements like an iron blade or tari found at the Jesuit house. Clearly, native Visayans were interacting within a vibrant network of materials and culture, and already expressed a vital shared culture throughout the region with connections even into the northern and southern archipelago. For example, Tausum. Iranon and Balangingi were perhaps already intrusive from the Sulu Sea raiding for slaves in the 17th century, and gold was found in burials in Cebu that could have been from sources in the Agus del Sur, or perhaps Masbate or Ilocos, where gold was mined. But was Cebu City an entrepot or central place before the Spanish created one in the center of eastern Cebu? Or was it one of many good anchorages along the coast where precisely the same material culture is found in archaeological sites? with notable differences in relative periods and densities, but not in any place demonstrative of a permanent central trading platform. That concept of a networked environment extends to all of the Philippines before the Spanish. There appear to have been many local places with good anchorage where offshore traders could stop for exchange with local villages. But except possibly Butuan, did these grow into established trading centers until the age of foreign colonization? And further, there, there does not appear to be any dominant extensive material culture that would denote a Filipino polity or even shared vision of a Philippine archipelago. The Philippines were thus invented by the outside world, and that is not a revolutionary viewpoint to recognize, but that the Philippines was so well hidden from the larger world of empires and commerce until so late into the 16th century is remarkable. There were sallies around the edges, maybe occasionally junks would penetrate the interior, but the world largely was unaware of the diverse and dispersed peoples living in the region. So much so that Filipinos were exhibited like zoo animals at the Colombian exhibition in the 1890s in Chicago, and anthropological visits to the interior still encountered remote people throughout its 
the early 1900s and even as recently as the 1970s when Tosadai were discovered in southern Mindanao. The Philippines were still at the edge into the late 20th century. Nonetheless, the resilience and adaptability of Filipinos appears to be very persistent and robust. With increasing globalization, Filipinos now occupy most of the world as OFWs, spouses, students, and professionals entering into American, European, and other first world centers. They link Filipino communities through remittances and immigration of expanding family networks. The intrepidity of people who quietly but steadily settled in unknown archipelago now practice that skill and adaptability at globally, and may be from the early times until now, one of the most adaptive collective populations in global history. Thank you. Dr. Peterson's presentation, thank you very much. I think Dr. Peterson is already here. Um, if you have any questions uh, regarding his presentation, we will be able to answer them. Do we have questions from, from our attendees? You can use the Q&A box, or if you are tuning in by a Facebook live stream, you can actually leave a comment on the live stream on the NQC official Facebook page. All right, do we have questions? from the group or participants. I think they're still warming up. <laughs> 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 but thank you very much uh, for that insightful uh, presentation. I do have, I'm very curious about um, uh, Boreals because since uh, I was able to join the archeological project here in Northern Cebu, um, I'm very curious about what what are the what other artifacts are often seen in different archaeological sites in in Cebu aside from from burial uh, burial goods or grave goods. Are there any other sort of um, artifacts or materials that we can actually that will actually help in establishing a period or in order for us to assume a sort of a network? of the Philippines to other to other areas. Thanks, Regina. Yeah, actually, uh, burials are probably the, the best documented. They're easiest to find, and they have really good preservation. Mm -hmm. But we've been doing aerial regional survey for 20 years now. And one of the things, of course, we found at the beginning was when you walk along the shoreline in places like Karkar uh, or Cebu City or even Liloan or a bit north, sometimes you're literally crunching on pottery in the ground, on top of the ground. It's an incredible, beautiful blue and white porcelain from China and so forth, probably uh, late Ming period. Uh, but then when we walk, when we walk in, the, uh, in the highlands, in the interior, we find very highly dispersed artifacts, uh, maybe one every 10 square meters, one shirt. Uh, and often it's not the Chinese late Wanli period uh, material, but it's often uh, a bit earlier during what we call the Ming Gap, when the Chinese were not trading uh, into the, globally from, from their uh, kilns in China. Um, and instead, uh, the Thai and Vietnamese potters stepped up and made a sort of a crude estimation of, uh, uh, I don't mean that disparagingly, but uh, of the Chinese porcelain. And we find those shirts abundantly in the highlands. Now, is this a matter of people living in different periods, more so in one area than another. We don't know, we don't have enough data yet. But it also suggests that people, when they did live in the highlands, were probably living on small villas next to uh, very mobile Sweden uh, farming uh, areas. So they would grow crops in an area for a year or two or three, and then move to another area, and perhaps move their whole residence. And then along the coast, on the other hand, we think probably people weren't living there full time in the balais along the coast, even though the Spanish thought it made it look like there was a huge settlement on the coast. We, we think actually that people were living there occasionally for fishing junkets. And in fact, in the ethnographic record, there are accounts of, uh, for example, families of farmers in the mountains who would go to their balai along the shore on Saturday, maybe Friday night and Saturday, they would fish and then Sunday morning, the family would go to mass 
And then by Sunday afternoon, they'd walk back into the mountains to their farm patch or perhaps even still, in many cases, swidden patches in the mountains. So people live in the landscape a lot of different ways, and it's not permanent in any one place. It's One must think about it very flexibly, I think, and adaptively. So in other words, during that period, we find, or during that period in the Ming Gap, we find lots of, uh, of uh, imported pottery scattered in the mountains along with earthenware pottery. Um, were more of them resident in the hills then? We're not really sure. Other artifacts are less common. Uh, we look for stone tools, and uh, we know that there's some areas in Negros, uh, northeastern uh, Negros Oriental, that have uh, uh, some possibilities and potential for finding these. These might indicate earlier Paleolithic, Paleolithic peoples. We're hoping to find more of those in Cebu during the Northern Cebu Archaeology Project. Um, and, of course, the jackpot would be the very old uh, Homo erectus era, 700,000 year old sites, which we have landscapes that could actually have supported uh, the Karkar formation in the western side of Cebu. Some farmers showed us tektites, a very small uh, item, but something that came from an asteroid that hit the earth in China 700,000 years ago and scattered through the region. Anyway, they're there on the land surface, which has eroded a little bit, but it's still a highly uh, uh, a, a, a lot of potential there to find this earlier 700,000 year old settlement like the Kalinga site in the northern, which is in, in the northern Philippines, which is incidentally on the same age landform as the Karkar formation. So a lot of exciting stuff, different kinds of artifacts, but the majority of what we'll find is probably in the burials. And so far we only have in Cebu burials from say right around 1400 to 1600. And then at, for example, in Bohol, <coughs> and then we have, of course, the, the San Remigio from 500 to 700 AD or CE. So we've got a lot of work to do. The biggest problem is there's been so little work. So we need to make sure we get uh, more field time. We got to go next week. Let's go. <laughs> it's going to be more challenging now to do archaeological projects because of the pandemic, but it's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. We just dodged it in San Remigio. Rosina was there. And, we got in during a period of very low uh, uh, contagion, and yeah. we got out before it started, and now it's dropped again, so we're kind of all getting eager to go back up. <laughs> all right. Uh, John, um, we have questions uh, from okay. our attendees now. I'd like to read the first one. It seems that there is no trading center in the Philippines. Uh, kindly enlighten us. Some are saying that it's Butuan, Mindoro, Bigan, Manila. Were these the centers of trade? I think so. As I read the records and read great interpreters like William Henry Scott and others, I think those are in whatever literature is available, which is very sparse. They seem to be named most frequently and perhaps misidentified. It's it's hard to tell. Uh, but at least in the early Spanish chronicles, uh, Butuan and Lusau appear to be more of a, a developed center. And there's a lot of talk about the materials coming in there. And then, of course, the trading records that Rodney Duck uh, documented. Uh, be interested in hearing what uh, 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 our next speaker has to say about that if he studied with him. So that's fabulous. Um, but anyway, he, he documented that there was trading with uh, Butuan, at least very roughly in the literature. And it uh, seems likely that they could have been trading to the Banda Islands down the line, or nutmeg, cloves, other spices. Uh, which grow pretty much only there. Um, but Manila seems to have been a, 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 a Moro, a Moro uh, settlement within a Chinese uh, parian that, that was very uh, quickly developed. Apparently it was there when Legaspi arrived. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, yeah. And uh, so uh, I think that they, you know, there's much talk about how they went north because of the inability to find enough food on Cebu. But on the other hand, a, a real burning desire for the Spanish was that to tap into that China trade. They actually, uh, they were interested in the spices too, but I think that China trade was something they thought they could uniquely capture, and they did for several hundred years through the Manila Galleon. Um, now, Mindoro is named as an early site, but there doesn't seem to be much to support any, any uh settlement that's really very dynamic or very, or very uh, permanent. Uh, and, and if you read all the descriptions of Cebu when the Spanish came, 
there did appear to be a, some political power there, maybe some tribal power from the leadership, but you don't read about monumental sites of any kind until the Spanish settled it. Uh, and in fact, as we look around the downtown, we've been working on the Patria site for several months. We first thought, ah, it's right there near the Cebu Cathedral, near the Plaza Independencia. We're going to find lots and lots of uh, burials from the right before the Spanish period. Must have been the center of the village. And we didn't find any. <laughs> but as we looked at the uh, maps, we've been doing environmental maps of downtown Cebu. And as we studied the maps and LIDAR data and so forth, I think it's becoming apparent that actually that was that area where the Patria is was a wetland, overbank flooding, probably not a permanent marsh, but but at least during periods of flooding. Um, and so people would not have been building houses on it and would not have been burying in it. Uh, interestingly enough, we found a horse there. And this is going to be a fantastic uh, uh, question and hopefully contribution. We're right now doing biometric uh, measurements to find out if it fits into possibly having been a horse from Asia, maybe brought in by Indonesians. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if not, if it came with the Spanish, there are very different biometrics for both of those varieties of horses. Uh, and we're working with Noel Amano at the Max Planck Institute in Jena in Germany. And uh, this will be an exciting uh, addition to the literature. But the disappointment that we had in not finding burials may actually have turned into some new insights into the whole development and evolution of the downtown Cebu landfill. Yes. So, still okay. progress. <laughs> yes, still progress. And there, I think there were a couple of other questions. Since I finished so early, I might as well keep talking. We have yeah. a lot of time to accommodate questions. Um, here's another one from M. Binamira. Hello, thanks for the interesting presentation. To say Cebu City was an active trading entrepot before the arrival of the Spanish could be, as you mentioned, just because of good anchorage, a trade center as we know them to be today was not a regular activity of Cebu City? Well, I, I don't think there's any evidence that, that, that it was. Um, and I have to say that a lot of the models that came in to interpret archaeology in the Visayas emerged from a whole school of thinking at the University of Michigan in the 1960s and 70s. Very, very good scholars, excellent scholars, who, who really made a huge difference and a contribution to global theory and so forth. Um, but it was very materialistic and very uh, uh, neo-evolutionary, which means they thought of, they followed this model that had first been sort of proposed in the 50s, 1950s, that, 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 that societies evolved uh, organically like people. And they evolved from band level organizations of egalitarian peoples up through uh, small tribes with maybe uh, maybe a chiefdom or something, then through ranked societies, and then finally into states. And the way the proposal worked, it sounded almost inevitable that people would evolve into our wonderful civilization of today with our states that are destroying the planet. So yeah. wonderful that they're actually destroying our nest. Um, but anyway, uh, the whole idea was that the, that the trend in human evolution and societal evolution was toward hierarchical organization with a, a, a king or a, or a political leader at the top and then layers of administrative peoples and so forth. Um, but I think we've recently, in, 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 eh, probably in the last few decades, but especially very recently, I think we've sort of begun to uh, realize the that that model doesn't really fit too well. And uh, beginning in the 90s, a, a historical ecologist named Carol Crumley developed a theory about heterarchy, meaning that power can be shared horizontally. It's, it's a model that fits the Philippines a lot better. And it, in, it, in, it implies people that may be a, a leadership role of, in a community, but they don't necessarily uh, accrue wealth. And in fact, the other part of this is that objects or things are not just commercial. We're, we think of that because that's the way we perceive the world today. But, but I think we really seriously need to look at things for their social value, for their religious and ritual value, like the porcelain. Uh, I have to tell you, I didn't hold that slide on long enough, I'm very sorry, uh, but the dancers around the altar um, in, in uh, Zamboanga and the Subanan ritual 
uh, that was really uh, eerie and mysterious and mesmerizing, the sound of the tinkling. Imagine hitting a porcelain bowl and then you're tinkling and then the gong, 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 and then they're drumming on, on uh, bamboo uh, cores and things too. Uh, it's incredibly uh, mysterious and mesmerizing, and it would definitely have set the stage to help transport people into more of a, a religious sort of frame of mind. And by religious, I don't mean like Catholic Church religious. I mean like, you know, pagan okay. religious, yeah, <laughs> uh, animistic religious uh, frame of mind. Um, so so uh, the social life of things can change quite dramatically. And I think the commercialization or our vision that these were commercial trading items is really uh, is misplaced. Um, the other thing is, so this these theories from this Michigan school also embraced uh, some theories that were being developed at the time for Southeast Asia, uh, which, uh, which uh, for example, with Bennett Bronson, modeled trade happening along river courses into the interior. Well, this works great for the Mekong, which is a tertiary river with many branches going out and river iron travel by boat. It doesn't work for primary drainages, single drainages with no, no tributaries and no uh, depth in the Philippines, especially in, in the narrow islands like Cebu and, and Negros and so forth. Uh, you can't travel by boat on those arteries, for starters. You might walk along them. They would at least be a course through the hills. But as you know, if you've tried that, it's very rough. Sometimes the more difficult route into the islands. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so the Bennett Bronson uh, model, river, the river tributary model, just doesn't really work. And yet it was applied to interpretations in this IAS by, by students of this Michigan school, as was the whole model of chiefdoms, uh, based again on this, this uh, neo-evolutionary model of, of uh, human society. And chiefdoms were everywhere. In fact, one of the books, if you counted the word chiefdom or chiefly or chief, it would probably be the dominant word in the entire book. It's almost a, almost a mesmerizing chant in itself, if you will. <laughs> I think we were very mesmerized by the concept, but it's hard to find chiefs, and it's certainly almost impossible to find evidence that they accumulated wealth or that they lived in bigger structures. Uh, in fact, it was probably more of a, uh, a, a leadership was more a matter of uh, wise decision-making, counsel, uh, possibly also ritual leadership and so forth. Uh, and again, central places in these theories are all modeled as economic. Okay, you put a you put a trading center at the mouth of a river, and then you trade up and down the river, and the goods come down. Blah blah blah. But the fact is, they didn't exist. You know, they've not been found. Uh, and if you think that commercial value of these things may have not been an issue or not been a an important value for these people, then again, you say, why would they even organize themselves like that? The point is not to trade things for commercial value or even a polity of the power of the chief, you know? Anyway, so there's a lot of discussion that's probably needed here. And if any of my Michigan colleagues would care to join in, I'm happy. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think the power places are the ones we found there in Quintarija. And uh, that was a lucky find in many ways, except we saw by the name and Jober's help with some in, uh, interpretation of the name that it could have been a combination of a native and Spanish word, Torrijan, maybe from Tower, the Spanish built lookouts. We thought at the very least, well, there's got to be like a little Spanish lookout up there. And bingo, we're climbing the slopes and there are all these little broken pottery the size of, uh, well, that could be put together in small jars, just like in the Alienar site and on the Subanan site by the way. Um, I think we really uh, will be on the lookout for more of those in the survey, but I think we really hit on what was probably the real power or central uh, place <laughs> in the region of our service. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, John. Um, here's another question for you um, from Paolo and Marie Andre. What do you think is the significance of the stone tools that you've mentioned earlier to the burial digs? Really discovered in one location? Uh, they so they aren't usually discovered. Uh, now, sometimes on sites with pottery, people haven't really maybe been attuned to find them and they're maybe swamped by so much of the pottery they don't really notice it so much. Where we have noticed stone tools 
and is usually on sites that have only stone tills on them. We have found a site up uh, in Upper Napo near Karkar mm -hmm. with a with a very crudely uh, flaked uh, limestone, uh, dolomitic limestone uh, uh, cores. We call them cores because that's what flakes are taken from. And flakes, and these are in prehistoric, pre pre Spanish sites, these are often used. In fact, in pre ceramic sites, these are often used for their cutting and, and uh, sometimes uh, gouging uh, uh, qualities and so forth. Sometimes we find obsidian. Now we know that those were worked by people specifically brought in for sharp cutting jobs. We found obsidian on the Alienar site, and so did Rosa Tanasis. We have found it in a few other sites. It, we not really sure. I I wish people could help with this. We I think there may be a site where that's naturally outcropping in Negros. Uh, the only close sites right now are somewhere in the Solomon Islands, which seems very unlikely uh, that it would be traded in that far. But anyway, obsidian is an obvious marker for a sharp tool. Obsidian can be napped, napped and flaked so finely that it's used, it was before the advent of lasers, it was used for eye surgery. Oh. Incredibly sharp, yeah. Uh, and people in the uh, pre-modern landscape knew that, they, they selected for that tool. But just chert, the flints that you find, they'll, they'll form as solution deposits in limestone. And, uh, and they're very fine, uh, cryptocrystalline it's called, uh, stone, and they can be napped and flaked into tools. But we don't find finished arrowheads. I worked in the Southwest and in Texas for many years. And there you get these beautiful, they're called arrowheads or dart points or whatever. Beautiful, finely made. You've seen them, of course, many pictures of them. Uh, we don't find those here. And that's where I think uh, some of us think maybe bamboo was selected as a better, easier tool to work and expendable. You shoot it once and it's, you know, it's easily to, easy to whack up another <laughs> bamboo point. But in other words, they, they were using something because they weren't using the stone. The other thing then is the larger stone tools that are found and are usually part of a, tools that are used for battering or maybe chopping or hoeing. Uh, and those we haven't found many of, but there are some very prominent, very important sites in the Philippines that really need to be explored more. Some are there in Eastern Negros, shared by a collector who came to the museum. Uh, lots of pictures of really incredible uh, materials that he found there. And, uh, and of course, another is called the Arubo site in southern Nueva Ecija. Uh, a farmer was digging a fish pond. He, uh, he hit large boulders of, uh, of chert, and around them were flakes that were obviously broken off, done by humans or hominids or something. And he went to the National Museum, and uh, Alfred Pollock and Bong Gazong went out to check it out. And they were just astounded that the, the stone tools actually appear to be Achillean, which means they would be Homo erectus era or 700,000 years ago. Wow. And that's they were, it's incredible. <laughs> so these sites exist here. And that's what we want to, we're going to walk a lot of the hillsides of uh, Western Cebu to look for things like that. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Um, yeah. All right, we have an anonymous attendee. I think uh, I'm just rephrasing um, his question. Have you debunked any information or any previous idea because of your findings in the field as an archaeologist? Have I developed any theory, kind of overall theory for the Messiahs? Or, um, well, yeah, a lot of it is coming out in the, the kind of uh, statements that I've been making here that I think <coughs> I think we have to we we'll have to try to get outside of all of our modern, you know, uh, capitalistic, uh, uh, global ways of thinking about things and perceiving things, and as as much as possible, try to try to see what it's like to see the world from a from a, for lack of a better word, pre-modern point of view. Anthony Giddens coined that back in the I think it was in the eighties. It works very well. Prehistoric, we've discarded. Uh, savage, thankfully, we've long ago discarded. Pre-modern means people who, who, who have a very different way of looking at the world, languages and sense of place and orientation to the landscape all play a role in this. And it's something we have to relearn, I think, as, as, uh, as uh, people within our modern world, we have to relearn those skills. Um, 
anyway, I think that people moved differently in the landscape before Europeans, and they had very different. They did, they weren't so goal oriented. Uh, there's a whole uh, theory of Austronesian migration that many of us are very critical of because it implies like an, a goal orientation. Like people in Taiwan decided to jump on boats and run over to northern Luzon, and from there they spread down the coast and out into the Oceania and founded these cultures and societies and blah blah blah. Um, I, I think it's much more sophisticated and it's subtle, but it's, I think, much more realistic to think about migrations like that as a reticulate process. That word means uh, it basically kind of interbedded and nested kinds of ways of moving around the landscape. And we have, like, if we look at ethnographic models of the Bajau and the Moken, we see that they'll go out for opportunities in the sea. And in those little boats, even by sail, they can go 20, 30, 40 miles a day, no problem. In a week, they can go a couple hundred miles, easy. And they go out from ethnographic documentation, they go out to, say, fish in the lee side, say, during the Amihan, they'll fish in the north southwestern side of an island where the water's calmer. And then during the Habaga, they'll go to the other side of the island. But they may go 100 or more miles to a whole other island. And then they may go visit villages that have kin through matrilineal kin systems, or that have items they want to trade for. Uh, and before, when they leave, that this isn't all mapped out. It's, it's not like mapped out in their head. It, it depends entirely on how the seasons progress and, and information they get along the way. And I think this kind of what, we, what I would call a reticulate migration is a much more reasonable way of looking at how people were migrating through the islands, through island Southeast Asia, and then into Oceania uh, 3,000, 3,500 years ago, when, when 3,000 years ago, it appears there did begin to become some uh, radiocarbon dates from that era show that there was more expansive movement of peoples during that period, not 4,000 years ago, that there wasn't much of anything at that time, no dates support that, but later, and then when you find those dates, they're all over the place, all at once. They're in Indonesia, they're in mainland Southeast Asia, they're here in the Philippines, they're in the Sulu Sea, they're in Mindanao. It's happening, and they're also beginning to be, appear in New Guinea in the areas that we call the Lapita area, which possibly came out of this process. Um, but it's happening all at once. Well, of course that makes sense because people could move so rapidly and their way of perceiving the, the seascape was so different. I could go on about this, I don't know how much time we have, but basically when people get in a boat, the, the navigators in Micronesia that I've had the, the wonderful opportunity to work with when I was at the University of Guam, um, when they get into a, uh, uh, a boat, um, they set off, but, but they don't go to Guam from yet. Guam comes to them. It's a very different way of perceiving the world. They are in the center of their universe, and they see the constellations and the sun rising and setting and the moon rising and setting, and they sense where they are in the world, but they themselves are not moving. It's the world that's moving around them. So it's a very different time-space perception model than what most of us experience. We probably don't have the patience for it, you know, for starters. But they have many subtle clues like constellations, but also ocean currents. And they learn this from their parents, the, the earlier navigators. Once they hit a certain point, they should begin to experience a current coming from this direction. And that they'll call, for example, the current that's formed from the gap between Guam and, and the Rota. And then they'll begin to feel. So it's very subtle, uh, but it's a spatial way of perceiving the world. And I doubt very seriously if anyone in Taiwan had a spatial model of zipping across a channel against a seven knot current in a canoe, because they didn't have sailboats, paddling. They couldn't paddle against a seven knot current. If anything, they went back and forth from Taiwan to mainland China. And this is models developed by many people lately using linguistics and genetics. And then down along the South China Sea, along shores both in mainland Southeast Asia and in the Philippines. And that period of the colony, colony saw wind that, that Solheim models captures exactly a spread of, of cultures and ideas and peoples and also pottery and languages and so forth that happened around that time, 2,500 to 3,000 years ago. So the timing's off on that other deal, but it's uh, also a, uh, the way of modeling human experience and human uh, 
motives is, is uh, I think, not really uh, very robust. It doesn't really take into account these other much more subtle kinds of migrational patterns, particularly. Thank you, John. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, we have um, actually a comment and a question, I think, uh, on the chat box. She's Evangeline Lopez. I come from the Sibonga town and lived in the barrio called Gandagit, the first barrio of Sibonga after Okana, her car, which Dr. Peterson mentioned. I do recall some kind of excavation or treasure hunting of sort that went on at the time in 1960s. They had the occasion of finding broken pieces of Chinese ceramics in blue design. There is an old pottery making in Okana, Kar Kar, in the barrio of Abogon. I wonder if Dr. Peterson has that in his documentation. Thank you. Are you familiar with that, John? I am. Thank you, Evangeline. So the Abugan potters are the ones, in fact, that are using the clay source in Valley of the Lead, right next to the old Salu uh, parish that we excavated. We excavated there in 2002. Uh, if someone was treasure hunting, uh, might have been Rosa Tenasis, who wasn't treasure hunting, but it might have been Tony. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, this is, I don't mean this in any denigrating way, but to they called him Tony the Mora. And I don't know his last name. He was a Vietnam, U.S. Vietnam vet, a black soldier. And they call him a Moro because he was black, right? <laughs> but he, he married a woman in uh, uh, Napo and uh, was well liked in the area. He had a little motor scooter and he went cruising all over the place. He found Neolithic Adzes up on the top of the hills. And he's the one that found that site that, we, that Rosa and we both excavated. Uh, and he had some sense of what they were, and he took the material to the uh, USC Museum. Most of what he found, I think, is there in whatever uh, uh, collections Rosa left behind. Anyway, <coughs> the Abogon Potters uh, were also visited by Bill uh, Longacre, and I have a small article where he mentions going there and talking to the Potters, and then he did, before he passed away, we talked about it. He couldn't recall that, but I'll have to dig out that article and find it. So, so the family there has been, uh, has been uh, visited by them and by me. My wife's, uh, uh, one of my wife's school friends is the daughter of the woman that runs the pottery, the family that runs the pottery. They make a fabulous, uh, very well-made uh, little uh, uh, jars and, and bowls for cooking, utilitarian use. I think they make... Well, they at least make those and sell them in the car car market. Mm -hmm. And they're very inexpensive. Uh, we visited them with the idea that, uh, uh, well, we wanted to learn how they were making them. But we also thought, what if they could imitate these colony burial jars with the beautiful, you know, carinated edges and the nice diverted rims and so forth? And they did. They made a few and they were beautiful. They did a really good job. And we took them to the museum at, with the hopes that maybe uh, they could be sold there to visitors. I see. They're the right size for a tourist to buy and carry home in their luggage. And I told the, the potters, I said, you know, if you made those, you could probably get at least 10, maybe more times the money making those. And it's almost identical to the market stuff they're making. And they couldn't believe it. They just thought that was funny. <laughs> but we never got it off the ground. The museum never really followed through. And so now it's your turn. <laughs> this, this pottery making in in um, in Okanya, Karkar, is it's already an old an old um, livelihood for them. Yes, and yes, yeah. At least fifty years, maybe much longer, I don't know. If Angela maybe can tell us if she knows the family. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe we, you know, it'd be a great ethnographic project for somebody to do for a master's thesis or something. You know? Right. And what, yeah. why did she, why did she discover uh, the blue, blue ceramic, blue and white ceramic? Blue That's blue. just appearing on the ground around there near Abogon. We actually, there's one site that we were going to work on. A student from Ateneo was going to work on, uh, or I guess it was the University of Hawaii at the time, was going to work on it. It's out in the Mango. Uh, uh, plantation out sort of toward Okanya from Abubon. Yep. And uh, there's lots of blue and white ceramic there right on the surface and in the upper deposit. So it's all over in that area. Uh, must have been a fair amount of coastal settlement. 
But if there's no way to anchor, you know, like junks and galleons in there, you know, I don't think it could have ever developed into a uh, an entrepot of any kind like supposedly these other areas did. I suspect that those large ships stopped at places where they could, where the where the uh, geography on the lands on the coast gave them a deep anchorage or some protection from storms and so forth. But much of the area is uh, full of very shallow coral reef uh, platforms, and you just there's just no way to land a boat. So the entrepot, quote unquote, I think emerged in places where people were already living, but dispersed along the coast. But then wherever the ships could get near them is where there might have been a little more concentration. And then over time, with increasing Spanish settlement, they concentrated uh, probably settlements in those areas. All right. Well, Evangeline uh, is really quite interested to pursue a documentation on awesome. the pottery. She reply? And she's hoping that um, she could probably meet you or visit you in your office when she's in Cebu. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's fine. And if nothing else, we can do a messenger call to each other. But uh, we come to Karkar. So my wife's family is from Napo. And I'm not sure when we'll be around there again, but we also keep in touch. Maybe send me an email. I'll put my message, my address in here. Yeah, uh, other attendees are actually asking if they could ask for your um, email address. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question over here. Um, I think this is from PIQC Technical Group. Uh, good morning, Dr. Peterson. Was Samar Island? which is at the edge of the Pacific involved or included in the trade route, or did it play any role in the early trading traditions of the Philippines? In the early Spanish trading, you mean? Um, well, most of it, well, from the galleon trade that was going a bit north of there because it went from like Cavite and then over through Sorsogon. So it would have been the very northern end of Samar would have been where ships were going out into the open Pacific. That would have been uh, possible. Um, the very earliest settlement through the south, Homongong, for example, uh, well, that's south of Samar, I think. I don't have a map in my mind. I'd have to go, it's around the corner, I'd have to go. <laughs> but there was, uh, uh, I don't think there was any like direct landing on Samar. Somebody might, maybe uh, Raleigh Boronaga could correct me on that. But uh, I, I think if there was anything, it would have been in the north, the galleon trade going out through, the, through those passages to the Pacific. Or in the very south, the way that uh, the Spanish were first entering the region uh, before they got to Limazawa and then up to Cebu, uh, but not in the middle that I'm aware of. I, I could easily stand corrected on that and would be happy to be. Were you, were you able to include that in your map earlier in your presentation? Well, like there's the nothing, nothing along that whole eastern side. At least the material that came from Rodney Tack and others, they don't show anything. Uh, and 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 there were some anecdotal um, comments. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I think William Henry Scott mentioned some things about maybe a big junk, like beginning in the Yuan would dynasty period, would cruise through the area. Maybe they would often have, maybe they didn't have regular routes. It's hard to say. But once a year, each of those junks could carry 100,000 ceramic vessels. They're enormous, <coughs> especially the ones during the early Ming period. And uh, uh, so if a ship went through, it wouldn't have to do it one, more than once a decade and unload stuff that make it look like a huge trading expedition <laughs> that passed through 100,000 vessels. Um, but again, the people, I don't think they were taking them for trade items. I would think they were taking them for ritual purposes. To, was it all during the pre-colonial? Yeah, pre-colonial. Then colonial period, that all pretty much far as I can tell, dried up. Uh, the the Dutch and the English were 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 entering the area through the Taosug and others like like James Warren documents and conducting this proxy war against the Spanish uh, Visayans and others. And then the other sort of exchange that was going on was mainly in the north with the Galleon. Right? And the stuff being traded out of the Visayas to the south was slaves or household members, slave may not mean quite the same thing, uh, but uh, that uh, that and they weren't trading for durable items that I'm aware of. 
the English, this is funny, the English tried to introduce opium through the Taosug and Baran Gingi and so forth, and Ranan, but it didn't work out very well, and they couldn't get the Taosug to use it. But if you imagine, here's a people that are used to eating, uh, chewing betel nut, which is a mild stimulant, and if you're, you need all your wits about you at sea. <laughs> opium is not a very good uh, drug to be taking to pilot a boat. <laughs> They weren't interested in the opium. They tried to pass it off on the science. They weren't interested in it. Eventually, it was traded in by the English into China. This is all very interesting. It's the European powers that actually created the drug trade centuries ago. Uh, anyway, little aside, I think James Warren shared that bit of information. <laughs> We're down to, I, I guess this is a a question regarding your publications or your future publications. Will we be able to read them? In yes. The yeah, many are in. I've been publishing in the Philippine Quarterly for Culture and Society for many years. And also, so those are available to people who can access that journal. It's on JSTOR. Unfortunately, they charge unless you have a university account of some kind. But then they're available there at San Carlos Publications and in the library, of course. Um, also, I have publications in things like uh, uh, Asian Perspectives and the SPAFA Online, the SPAFA Journal. We just published a, an online article about the environmental history of Cebu. Mm -hmm. Go to the SPAFA, S-P-A-F-A -A site, and you can download that for free. And the Jesuit House, there's some of the Jesuit House material is in that. Um, we have some other articles We'll do a report on the Jesuit House, but that hasn't come out yet. That was a real wonderful uh, uh, source of, doc of material and, and uh, from the findings. And then our San Remigio project, ongoing now. We have some field reports. Uh, we'll be developing them into uh, long report publications, maybe book publications from San Remigio and Northern Cebu. Those are coming up. Uh, but I'd say the easiest things to access would be the Philippine Quarterly, and then the online SPAFA journal, which is, you can just download them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, just to inform our attendees, if you are very much interested to read more about the papers presented today's, in today's session, the National Quincentennial Committee will actually be publishing all of the papers uh, presented to you today. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, John, for uh, having. You. Yeah, the time to be here with us and uh, take care. Are you still in Germany? No, no, I'm, I'm home after what, what turned out to be like almost 12 days of different quarantines in Germany and here, and I'm so happy to be home. I have to say, don't travel for a while. It's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we hope to see you see you again later. If you. Yes. I'll be around through the day. I'll, I want to tune in on my colleagues' presentations. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Again. All right. So now we are going to proceed to the second paper presentation entitled From Exclusion to Inclusion, the Visayas and its Participation in Long Distance Trade with China to be presented by Mr. Genesis Velas, an independent researcher and a former fellow of Monumenta Serica. Sir Genesis, are you around? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello? Yeah. Loud yeah. and clear. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So, good morning, and I don't know, it's afternoon here in Australia, and thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this uh, conference. Uh, I actually didn't expect that Dr. Bisales would invite me to this one. 
I was just contented watching uh, watching all these uh, talks. But uh, so here am I today. So the title is the exclusion from exclusion to inclusion: the Visayas and its participation in long distance trade with China. Ferdinand Blumentritt, in an 1879 self-published article, puts forward the position that the Chinese merchants could not have reached the Visayas in the pre-Hispanic times. He cites the admission made by the captured crew of Borne and Paral to Miguel Lopez de Legazpi that they bought Chinese copper and porcelain, as well as gongs from the Chinese and the natives of Luzon, and then bartered them with the Visayas with their native products. He notes that the first recorded encounter between the Spaniards and Chinese happened off the shore of Mindoro when the Spaniards sailed towards Manila. He then argues that if an earlier encounter had occurred when the Spanish dominion was still confined to the Visayas, the colonizers would have noticed it. Historian William Henry Scott records Blumentritt's position more than a century later, saying the presence of Chinese trade goods in the 16th century Visayas is a well-attested fact, but the presence of the Chinese themselves is more problematic. Scott pinpoints that while the post-Magellan Spanish expeditions received reports about the presence of Chinese in the Visayas and Mindanao, they had not encountered them not until 1569. He likewise mentions the Bornean pilots' admission that traders carrying goods from China were called Chinese regardless of their actual identity, and that Chinese ships, due to their size, could not navigate the inner waters of the archipelago. This somehow validates the fact that the Visayan term Sina refers to whether Bornean or Chinese people, and that a Chinese writer published in 1617 did not include any direction traversing the inland Visayan waters. He also adds that the term Hongko or Chunk, used in early Spanish accounts, is derived from the Malay word Jong, which refers to a ship built in Southeast Asia. There is seemingly a lack of discussion among historians regarding Blumentritt and Scott's position on the non-participation of the Visayas in the long-distance trade with China during the pre-Hispanic times, probably due to the scarcity of documentary evidence. Archaeologists, however, offer new insights into Visayas' participation in long-distance trade ascribed to the fact that archaeological excavations in the central Philippines have yielded a considerable number of Chinese, Southeast Asian, and Japanese ceramics. This paper then aims to provide a new perspective on what Scott called the Chinese enigma. First, it lays out the context of Chinese offices trading during the Song, Yuan, and Ming dynasties by examining the imperial policies of each period and assessing their impact on the activities of Chinese merchants. It also examines the Chinese perception of the Southeast Asian maritime space and the location of the Philippines in that space. Second, since Blumentritt and Scott relied on Spanish sources, this author shall attempt to elicit information from Chinese sources that refutes the alleged Chinese presence in the Visayas in the pre-colonial times. Finally, some possible scenarios concerning the participation of the Visayas in the long-distance trade with China will be explored. So China and the maritime trade. China's importation of foreign goods from Southeast Asia and beyond via the sea route was first made possible through the so-called Nanhai trade whose development can be divided into three phases based on the products sought after in the Chinese market. In the first phase, which extended from 221 BC to 420 AD, China imported luxury goods exclusively for the imperial court from the Yue and Injun merchants, and later from the kingdom of Funan. The second phase occurred between 420 and 618 AD, with the growth of both Buddhism in China, a new market base for holy things was tapped. 
the surging demand for incense, ivory statutes, and glass vessels eclipsed the importation of luxury goods, and the flow of most imported goods shifted to the worshippers in major urban centers. Eventually, the demand for drugs and spices supplied by Persian and Arab middlemen surpassed luxury items and holy things in the third phase, which stretched from 618 to 960 AD. With the collapse of the Tang Dynasty, China underwent a phase of fragmentation known as the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period that lasted for 54 years. The foundation of the Song Dynasty in 960 opened the way for the reunification of China. The Song Dynasty initially gained control of the Northern China and aligned its economy and diplomatic relations towards Central Asia and the regions beyond, with the Silk Road serving as a primary link to those regions. With the annexation of Guangdong in 970 and the establishment of Shibusti, or the Maritime Trade Office in the port city in 972, the Song Court set in motion China's engagement in maritime trade, albeit keeping it under the tribute system as practice in the preceding dynasties. Initially, maritime trade was not a primary priority of the Song Court. However, China's political and economic realities made the government consider maritime trade as a potential income generating enterprise. During the entire Song period, nomadic tribes to the north and west of China, such as the Mongols, Jurchens, and Liaos, attempted on various occasions to encroach the Song territory, which put pressures on the imperial government to increase its defense expenditure in order to protect its borders. Meanwhile, the Song government made the civil service examinations the only means for drafting bureaucrats, which eventually lead to the increase of the number of paid public servants. These two developments push the government to look for new means to raise revenues. At the same time, trends in the consumption change as more affluent consumers look for exotic and luxury items from abroad and as low value foreign goods became popular in the domestic market. One of the most one of the first moves of the Song government to address those issues was to increase the tariff on foreign cargoes from 10% to 20% of its net value while reducing the government's involvement in the domestic distribution of foreign products. In effect, there was a shift in the local distribution of foreign goods from being a state monopoly to an enterprise Marginally, marginally controlled by the local Chinese traders. However, it should be noted that the Song government introduced the classification of foreign goods into fine articles or high value products and coarse articles or low value products. When the government reduced its market share of foreign products, it only gave the private merchants access to low value products which made up most of the imported items and kept the local distribution of high value products. In 989, the Song government allowed private merchants to travel abroad and bring foreign goods back to China. However, they needed to adhere to specific provisions. First, they had to register before their departure at Chinese ports with established shibus to indicate their ports of call abroad. Second, they had to report at those ports upon their return for customs of inspection. Third, they had to limit their journey to one monsoon period, which means that they had to leave China in winter and come back by summertime. Unfortunately, compliance with government regulations was time consuming, and the time restraint imposed on the foreign ships prevented many Chinese traders from engaging in the importation of foreign goods. And precedentedly, in 1090, the Song government allowed prefecture level governments to issue travel permits to local Chinese traders, thus devolving the issuance of permits from a state to a local matter. The state, however, maintained its control over foreign trips, foreign ships coming to China. With the ease of acquiring permits to travel abroad, 
more and more Chinese merchants ventured into foreign trade and imported products sought after in the Chinese market. After centuries of defending its borders, the Jurchens gradually overpowered the Song army, which eventually led to the fall of Kaifeng, the imperial capital in 1127. As a result, the Song court moved its capital to the port city of Hangzhou. This started the period that historians would call the Southern Song. The loss of its Northern territory, traditionally the cradle of Chinese civilization, also meant the substantial loss of gov government revenues. Deprived of access to the Silk Road, the natural tendency of the Southern Song was to look towards the maritime region for diplomatic and economic relations. By 1234, the Georgian controlled territory fell into the hands of the Mongols, but it was not until 1272, under the leadership of Kublai Khan, that a dynasty in traditional Chinese style was proclaimed. The Southern Song coexisted with a newly established Yuan dynasty for eight more years before finally succumbing to the Mongols in 1279. The Yuan government, however, maintained the Song's maritime policy with some modifications over time. For instance, the distinction between fine and coarse articles was retained. The changes that the Mongols introduced included the lifting of tribe restrictions for foreign trade trips, thus enabling traders to go to faraway places and stay abroad for a more extended period. Under the Mongols, Shu Si issued licenses to private traders and provided them with capitals and ships. Traders paid back the government by remitting 70% of their profits. In this sense, the UN government monopolized foreign trade with Chinese merchants acting as their agents. Nevertheless, the merchants became more competitive and aggressive since the government's financing scheme enabled them to expand their business. The, bank, the Ming period, taking into consideration its attitude towards maritime trade, can be divided into four phases. The first phase started right at the foundation of the dynasty in 1368, and this lasted up to the early 15th century. Shortly after the foundation of the Ming dynasty, Emperor Taizu prohibited ordinary Chinese from traveling to the sea and ordered the closure of China from any maritime activity. The new restrictions were intended to regulate foreign trade and foreign relations and to stop private trading. With a maritime prohibition in force, only official embassies from foreign countries who sent tribute to Ming port were allowed to establish contact with China and engage in foreign trade. The second phase occurred during the early years of the 15th century, when China dispatched a series of diplomatic fleets under the command of Chang He. The expedition's aim was not to occupy trade outposts or establish colonies, rather than rather the incorporation of the rest of the world into the Chinese world order and their admission into diplomatic relations with China and their integration into the Chinese tribute system. Although Zhang He never set foot on Philippine soil, Zhang Qian and other eunuchs sailed towards the Eastern Ocean and persuaded rulers of Borneo and the Philippines to send tribute missions to China. The Philippine politics of Hemauli, Lusong, Fangjia Shilan, Sulu, and Kumalalang sent tribute missions to the Ming port between 14, 1405 to 1424. The third phase began after the end of those expeditions in 1433, with a ban on private trade still in force and in the Indirect trade between China and Southeast Asia was made possible for the Kingdom of Ryukyu, which maintained a regular tribute mission to China. Ryukyu served as an intermediary between China and Japan and Southeast Asia, with Thailand and Malacca as its principal trading partners. Furthermore, the inefficient control of the coastal regions, especially between 1457 and 1520s, 
and a connivance between traders and some local officials and leading Fujianese families led to the increasing rate of illegal trade. This also paved way for the subsequent rise of the Fujianese networks, which eventually dislodged the Ryukyuan merchants as the principal carriers of Chinese goods to Southeast Asia. The lifting of private trade restrictions in 1567 under the pressure of the governor of Fujian marked the beginning of the fourth phase. This phase coincided with the Spanish colonization of the Philippines, which attracted Philippine merchants to come to the archipelago due to the lucrative Manila Acapulco galleon trade. The Philippines in relation to the Chinese perception of Southeast Asia maritime space. The eventual expansion of Chinese commercial activities abroad gave rise to written works that provided the Chinese people with accounts of the commercial ports and polities extending from Southeast Asia to the east coast of Africa. Among the important writings in the Song period are Ling Wai Tai Ta, Chu Feng Chu, Nan Hai Chu, and Tao Chu Lu. These works and all other books published during these periods presented to the Chinese readers some of new geographical concepts which indicated the evolving geographical understanding at the time. Ling Wai Daida was written in 1178 by a local magistrate in southwest China named Chu Chu Fei. It identifies four maritime regions that are associated with present-day Southeast Asia, uh, namely Dong Dayang Hai, Nan Hai, Xinan Hai, and Nan Dayang Hai. So Dong Dayang Hai is the Great Eastern Ocean, Xinan Hai is Southwest Sea, Nan Dayang Hai is the Great Southern Ocean. Of these four maritime spaces, Nan Hai was considered the most important because of its association with Srivijaya, which was the main trading center south of China. The waters farther to the south of Srivijaya were called Nanda Yanghai. Far, to, far away to the west of this Southeast Asian kingdom was the Xinan Hai. Moreover, Zhu Chifei's description of Dongda Yanghai illustrates the Chinese paucity of knowledge about the Philippines and Eastern Indonesia. So in this text, he writes, this text here, uh, southwest of Hainan, southwest of Hainan, uh, there's, this, there's a sea called Chao Jiang that is presently the Gulf of Tonkin. In the middle of the sea, there is a three-joint current which breaks into three due to the strong waves. So one current flows southward to the Sea of the Barbarian Lands, one to the north towards the Sea of Guangdong, Fujian, and Zhejiang provinces, and one to the east towards the boundless place called Dong Dayang Hai, or the Great Eastern Ocean. There are two interesting features that can be found in the Great Eastern Ocean. So one is the one in the red rectangle and the other one that's inside the yellow rectangle. So in this, the first one, the one inside the red rectangle, uh, Hirth and Rekhil translate this uh, Changsha Shitang Shu Wanli as long bank of sands and rocks, some myriads li in length. The translation follows the principles that words in classical Chinese texts are often monosyllabic. That is, each character represents a particular concept. So, Chang, Zhang, Lo, Long, Sha, San, Shi, Stone, Bank, uh, Tang, Bank, Shu, a mountain, one, ten thousand, and Li, a uh, mile. Sinologist Roderick Pitak, however, argues that there are disyllabic concepts in this set of characters, namely Changsha and Shitang, which are translated as reefs and atolls, respectively. Uh, 
He notes that these words are often given the attributes Qian Li, thousand miles, or Wan Li, ten thousand miles, in different combinations in various Song and Yuan sources. Hence, Changsha Shi Tang Shu Wan Li could also be read as reefs and atolls measuring ten thousand miles, which could point to the reefs and atolls in the South China Sea. Another feature that can be found in the Great Eastern Ocean is the Weilu, where the water drains off into the Jiuyu. These concepts are derived from Taoism. In the Taoist classic Zhuangzi, one can read, there is no water in the world larger than the ocean. All rivers revert to it ceaselessly, yet it is not filled. It leaks away at Weilu continuously, yet it is not empty. Meanwhile, Jiuyu, or ninefold darkness, is one of the Taoist conception of hell, which spreads out in nine directions, four cardinal, four ordinal, and the center. However, sinologist Angela Schottenhammer argues that Weilu is actually the Purushu current. So there can be two interpretations of the text here. The Great Eastern Ocean could be a site of a mystic, mythical place bounded by a bank of sand and stone and where its water drains off into the nether world. The other one, it is where the atolls and sandbanks, at, as well as the Kurushu current, can be found. Regardless of whichever of these interpretation one takes, it is evident that the Philippines are nowhere in this interpretation. Zhu Fenju, so the next book, Zhu Fenju, was penned in 1225 by Zhao Rugua, a superintendent of the maritime trade office in Chuangzhou. Like Ling Wai Daida, it describes that to the east of Hainan are Qianli Changsha, thousand reefs, and Wanli Shitang, 10,000 atolls. And beyond that is the boundless ocean where the sea and sky blend their color. The Wei Lu is no longer existent in the text. Instead, it provides description of two Philippine polities, namely Mayi, believed to be the present day Mindoro, and Sanyu, which is composed of Kalamian, Palawan, and Buswangla. It also identifies other places such as Baipuyan, Pulilu, Lijindung, Liuxin, and Lihan. The identification of some places within the archipelago may indicate that the Chinese trading network started to extend to the Philippines during the book's publication. During the UN period, geographical concepts of the preceding dynasties were discarded. In Nan Haiju, written by Chen Dachen in 1304, Southeast Asia was now divided into three maritime regions assigned to five polities, Danmaling, Srivijaya, Danmaling and Srivijaya controlled Xiaoxiang, Dongyang Funig, or the Xiaoxiang is the small western ocean, Dongyang Funiguo, which is probably Brunei, took charge of Xiao Dongyang, or the small eastern ocean, Tanjung Pura and Java ruled the Ta Dongyang, or the big eastern ocean. Xiao Dongyang is comprised mainly of the Sulu Sea and the waters of the coast of Parawak, Sarawak. The polities found in these maritime regions include Malilu or Manila, Maayi Mindo, or Mindoro, Meikun, Manukan in Samwanga, Butuan, Budu, Sulu, Shahuchong or Shukon in Samwanga, Yachen, Oton, Iloilo, Manolono, it's either the Maranaos of Mindoro or the Malano tribe in Kalimantan, and Wenduling or Cotabato. Based on the text, it is hard to determine the relationship between Brunei and the rest of the Philippine polities. Nevertheless, the list may be an indication that a maritime, net, maritime network within this space 
may have existed. Wang Dayuan sailed with seafaring traders in 1330s and wrote Dao Yu Lu upon his return to China. In this book, the maritime regions in Southeast Asia are further reduced to two, Dongyang and Xiyang, the Eastern Ocean and the Western Ocean. The Strait of Singapore served as the boundary between these two oceans. With this demarcation, it appears that most of the Southeast Asian countries were found in Eastern Ocean, while the Western Ocean corresponds to the modern day Indian Ocean. So uh, according to, Dao, uh, to Wang Daoyuan, uh, he visited 99 countries. So, and according to Pidak, uh, he divided it into Dongyang and Xiang with these two, Longyamin, which is uh, Singapore, and Kunlun, which is one of the islands near, near to Vietnam, uh, as it's uh, as the boundary between the Eastern and Western Ocean. The division between Eastern and Western Oceans was maintained in the Ming Dynasty, albeit the border of these two oceans was moved from Singapore to Kalimantan or Borneo. As a result, the mainland Southeast Asia and Western Indonesia are now found in the Western Ocean, while the Philippines and Eastern Indonesia are located in the Eastern Ocean. When the Chinese writers in the Ming Dynasty began to give details to the trade roads to Southeast Asia, two main lines emerge, the Western and the Eastern Road. So uh, this is from the text from Tung Shi Yang Kao. And what it says is that uh, in Wenlai, that is Brunei, the, it, it's where the Eastern Ocean ends and where the Western Ocean begins. The mines monopoly on inter-island trade. Long before mer Chinese merchants aggressively searched for foreign products abroad, foreign traders sold those goods to Chinese ports. Direct trade between China and the Philippines only occurred when the Chinese traders came to the Philippines in the 13th century. Surprisingly, Chinese traders limited their activities in Mayi and Sanyu. From Mayi, Chinese goods were transported to other islands for barter. The existing imperial regulations may have partly influenced the Chinese traders to remain in Mayi. First, there was a requirement to register their port of coal abroad and to remain there, which obliged them to stay in Mayi during the whole duration of their overseas trip. Second, the time restraint imposed on foreign trips prevented the Chinese merchants from going to places that may cause a delay in their return trip. Furthermore, the Chinese merchants who dock in Mayi were left with few options since the chief Tain highly regulated the transactions aiming to monopolize the inter-island trade. Local traders, not the Chinese merchants, unloaded the goods from the foreign ships and brought them to other islands. The active participation of the chieftain may have ensured that no goods were lost upon unloading and that local traders paid off their debts after they bartered the foreign goods with local products in other islands. Key to the efficient regulation was the designation of an area for trading. In the Chinese, in the Chinese text, the word used was guanchang. The character Guan, when used as a noun, denotes an officer, a government official, and an office bearer. As a modifier, it assumes the meaning of government, official, or public. Meanwhile, the components of the character Chang, namely Tu and Yang, indicate that Chang 
in its crudest sense, denotes an, a ground open to the sun, or simply put, an open space. Hence, the term official's place in Hearth and Rockhill's translation points to an open space designated for official functions regulated by the chieftain. In this sense, the chieftain of Mai not only acted as a political figure, but also as an economic manager in his polity. Chinese traders developed friendly relations with the local rural ruler to counterbalance the chieftain's total control of the business transactions. This was illustrated by the by their presentation of a gift to the chieftain of Mai upon their arrival. The function of this act was to create a symbolic bond of friendship, which had a conflict mitigating effect in case of inevitable disagreements during business deals. This bond may have also obliged the chieftain to extend his protection on foreign traders, thus enabling them to stay in Mai for an extended period. Furthermore, the Mayi chieftain's sphere of influence went beyond his own polity. Chu Fengzhi recorded that San Yu, Bai Puyan, Li Jingdong, Liu Xin were Shu, or subordinate to Mayi. In the Chinese text, the chieftain of Mayi had a title of Zhou Jiang. The character Chiu by itself stands for a tribal chief, and by pairing it with another character, Zhang, that is, elder or head, a, a Chiu Zhang denotes a paramount chief. As a paramount chief, the chieftain of Mai may have exercised political power over the subordinate polities, but may, may not necessarily have control in, in economic matters, as illustrated in the case of Sun Yu. Sailing directly to Sanyu was a way for some Chinese traders to circumvent the chieftain's control over trading. Since Sanyu was politically part of Mai, it would appear that those who traded, that those traders who bypassed Mai technically did not violate the imperial regulations for Chinese merchants to remain in their registered ports of call abroad. Mai's monopoly in maritime trade finally ended during the Yuan period due to the lifting of the regulations that limited the activities of Chinese merchants, which eventually enabled them to explore more faraway places without the fear of being penalized. One best example is Sulu. In Zhu Fanju, pearl was recorded as one of the products of Mai. However, in Dawi Julu, these items disappeared from their inventory. Instead, pearls were listed as an item of salute. Seemingly, the Chinese traders bypassed Mai and went, went straight to Sulu, where they traded their products with pearl. So the next section is uh, Pishai and the Maritime Raids. During the Song period, an ethnic group unknown to the Chinese appeared suddenly in the coastal villages of Chuanzhou and devastated them. Zhao Rugua in his book Jufanji identifies this group as the Pishai and provides the following information. Their language is incompre incomprehensible to the Chinese. Chinese merchants have no prior interaction with them. Their state of savageness can be observed through their nakedness, like uh, wild, -like, wild animal-like ferocity and cannibalism. Their place of origin is very close to Panghu Island, so close that they see each other smoke and fire. They make raids in the coastal villages of Chuanzhou, particularly in Shuiao and Weitu during the Chunxi reign, injuring and killing countless inhabitants. They are fond of iron, such as so much so that they take with them anything that is made of iron such as spoons, chopsticks, iron knockers, and soldiers' armor. They do not use boats, but bamboo rafts, which can be folded up like screens. John Rugwa's work may be well known among nine Chinese speakers due to the English translation of the text, but it is not the first and only written account about the Pishai raider, raiders. Fifty years earlier, Lin Guangchong writes an official document that describes the rain. He said, in the past, there was a place overseas called Pishai. 
whose forks appeared suddenly in Pinghu, an island of Chuanzhou, and then to Beijing, which was mo no more than 20 miles away from the prefectural sea. They were furless when they stared at the soldier's sword. They ate living humans as their meals, as if they were livestock. When someone took rulers and iron, they scrambled to collect them first. Wherever they went, knives, axes, hooks, and chisels, among others, were cut off. At the end of the raid, they would walk outside the ridge, killing those captured persons to serve as their provisions. They carried their boats and moved towards the sea, appearing and disappearing in the water as if they were walking on flat ground. In the neighboring areas of Chaozhou and Hoizhou, no one was able to fan them off. These people were nevertheless unpredictable. At first, no one knew where they took refuge, but they still have the tendency to harm other people. A few commonalities and differences can be observed when the two accounts are compared. Both accounts describe the savageness of the Pishaya people and the fondness of iron. However, they differ regarding the time and place of the raids and the sea vessels the group used. Whereas Zhao Rugua identifies a couple of coastal villages in Chuanzhou as the sites of the maritime raid, the account of Lin Guangchong details the stretch of devastation caused by the Pishaya raiders, which extends from Pangho Island near Taiwan to Beijing in the Fujian province and farther to Chaozhou in eastern Guangdong and Huizhou in the Pearl River Delta. Moreover, Zhu Fanchi fixed the time of the raid during the Chunxi period, but the raid Ling Guangcheng described could have occurred in Qiandao era, which was in 1165 to 1173. Finally, Zhu Fanji explicitly mentions bamboo rough, while Lin identifies Zhou as their mode of transport and records an imagery on how a boat was carried from the shore to the sea. He specifically used the term jia, jia uh, the one inside the yellow box, to carry, the meaning of it is to carry something under one's arm to describe the act of launching the boat. While it is impossible to carry a boat under, one, under one's arm, the imagery portrayed here may be that of men holding the boat's outriggers under their arms as they march towards the sea. Details about the raid in Pangho is written in Wang Dayu Shen Dao Bay, which is a stone tablet guarding a tomb, tomb passage on which are engraved the deeds of the deceased. The text appears in Jubida's book, Wen Zhongji, published in 1201. So it says, four months in the seventh year of Shindao, Wang Dayu started to administer Chuanzhou. In the middle of the sea, there is a large island called Pinghu, where Chinese settlers planted Malay, wheat, and hemp. There were Pishai barbarians who set sail and suddenly appeared here. Their bodies were pitch black and their language was incomprehensible. They seized all the crops. When the soldiers were mobilized to arrest them, they returned to the waters and got hold of nothing except their boats. Their captives served as their guides as they looted the nearby town of Chijo. Thereupon, troops were dispatched to patrol in spring and summer. In autumn and winter, the troops started to return to Chuanzhou. The efforts and expenses was, were enormous. So the official Wang Dayu visited this place and built a district of 200 houses. The Navy was stationed there, so the barbarians did not return. Zhou's use of the character Zhou, the one inside the red circle, and the expression Yang Fan, inside this uh, yellow circle, which means to hoist the sail, indicate that the Pishaya people arrived in Pangho using boats with a sail. Furthermore, until the construction of a permanent base for Chinese troops was made, their deployment was only seasonal, that is during autumn and summer, indicating that attacks were made during those seasons. 
The incident in Pangho also appears in the short biography of Wang Dayu that is included in Lo Ye's book Go, Gong Koi Chi. So it reads, fourth month of the seventh year of the Qian Dao era, Wang Dayu started to administer Chuanzhou, arrive in the prefecture. The prefecture is bordering the sea, where in the middle there's a sandy island measuring several tens of thousands of Lu called Pingho. As the Pishai Island barbarians suddenly arrive, they seize all the cultivated plants. On another day, they also went up the sea coast to murder and plunder. More than 400 invaders were captured, while their leaders were, well, their leader was eradicated. At the same time, those who remained were scattered through the region. At first, frontier guards were dispatched each each time the southerly wind was encountered, which was very laborious and inconvenient. As the official Wang reached their land, he built 200 houses, sent a general and troops to be stationed there. There was an officer with a rank uh, who was accustomed to stealing and receiving rewards. All of a sudden, he reported that an invasion had again taken place. He was straight away arrested and brought to the courtyard. He thought that he had done a meritorious deed. The official Wang Dayu said, the appearance of the Pishai is as dark as the Laka, that their tattoos are indistinguishable. What makes these people clothing and personal adornments entirely different? Square tonight, it, as it turned out, the great traders of Cambodia have four boats that have left and two boats that have returned. The two boats being suspected as that of Pishai is a false accusation. The first of all, Lo Ye's account corresponds to Ju Bida's account. He tells the looting incident and the establishment of permanent troops in Pingho. The expression Mei Yu Nan Feng, the one, the one in the red rectangle, which means each time the southern winds is encountered in relation to the deployment of soldiers to protect the island, suggests that these raiders were dependent on monsoon winds and arrived in Pangho on a seasonal basis. This certainly agrees with Jubita's account that Chinese troops were intermittently deployed during the spring and summer months. As a follow-up, Lu reported that one official made a false claim that Pishai had encroached their territory, to which Wang Tai reminded the officer that these people have dark skin, so dark that one could no longer distinguish their tattoos. Uh, there's also another document, but Jen Tishu, and another document from Chuanzhu Fuji Xuanlu. Uh, it says on the seventh month of the Chenda reign, island bandits to Shai pillage the coastal area. And again, on the eighth year, they once again intruded using seafaring boats. So again, uh, inside that red circle, that's and they attacked the Shreyao, so an outpost was built there. So where is uh, Pishai? Uh, scholars don't agree where Pishai is, but the one key to this uh, uh, where Pashai is, is actually found in the account uh, uh, Jao Rugo's account on Liu Chou. And uh, the problem with the classical Chinese is that the original text, they don't have uh, they don't have punctuations. So the problem with modern readers is uh, what punctuation do you have to use? So one Chinese scholar said that it should be uh, comma there. So if you read this text, uh, this text is about uh, the traders of Liu Chou, they went to San Yu to bring their products and sell them. And then after the word San Yu, there's a phrase, Bang Yu Pishai. So which means uh, besides it is Pishai. So if you put a comma there, so the meaning would be san yu, besides it, so it meaning san yu is pishai. But other 
scholars said that it should be a period after Sun Yu. So if you stop after Sun Yu and you read Bang Yu, Pishai, so it could mean Pishai, the it means Liu Chu. So besides Liu Chu is Pishai. So those who object that the uh, Pishai are the Visayan people argue that given the distance between China and the Visayas, it would be impossible for the Visayan raiders to reach China using bamboo rafts. But uh, based on what I have read earlier, most of the sources written before the publication of Jufanji identify boat and uh, bamboo rafts as the mode of transport of the Pishai raiders. And these boats have sails, as indicated in the expression yang fan, that is to hoist the sail, and possibly had outriggers as suggested by the expression jia zhou, to carry under one's arm during the launching of the boat. The roads were seasonal, as the raiders rely on monsoon winds. And there was also the story of a corrupt officer who made the false claim that the two boats that originally came from Cambodia, were said to be Pishai boats. Their boats must have looked the same because the point of distinction was not the boat, but the appearance and the tattoo of the Pishai people. Another argument uh, for those who object that Pishai are not the Visayans is that the Pishai come from, the, from southern Taiwan. So based on the account of Lin Guangzhou, he said that he didn't know where they come from. And Zhou Pidas and Lu Yue's account never mentioned Liu Chou, but implied that the Vishaya came from the southern area because they have to rely on the southerly winds to reach there. And then Zhen Di Shou mentioned that the Vishaya raiders reached the mainland, but he never made a claim that they came from Liu Chou. And then Zhao Rugua expressed a point, an expression which indicate the proximity of Pishaya from Penghu. Same expression was used, used in Wenshan Tongkao to indicate the proximity of Penghu to Liu Chou. And then more than half of the content of Jufanji on Liu Chu was actually copied from the history of the Soi dynasty, which was completed in the year 636. And Panghu was only settled by the Chinese around 13th century. So it could not be included in the Liu Chu account. So Zhao Rugua could have created the Peshaye country to accommodate Panghu. And then there's also an account from Yang Bowen that there were raiders from Babuyan. So the Visayan practice of Kayao could have taken in several stages from Visayas to Babuyan, then to Southern Taiwan, farther to Panghu, and finally to China. And their captives from Panghu could have served as their guides to the mainland. Do, do I still have time? Yes, sir. Oh, so we go to Dao Jilu. And um, so with the lifting of restrictions that limited their activities overseas, China's merchants sailed to all corners of Southeast Asia during the Yuan period, searching for rare animals, precious, precious timbers, aromatic substances, and expensive minerals. However, for two, for some other reasons, they excluded Visayas from their trading network. In the book Dao Julu, Wang Da Yuan gave an account of a place called Pishai, which undeniably is the, Visayan, is the Visayas as archaeological, ethnohistoric, and linguistic evidence corroborate his description of the place. So first Wang may have have the exact location of Bishai in mind when he wrote this phrase, 
This has been translated into English as out of the way spot in the Eastern Ocean or a remote land in the Eastern Seas. The problem with this translation is that they equated Haidong that's under the inside the red rectangle as Eastern Ocean, when in fact the term for Eastern Ocean is Dongyang, the one here in the inside the green box. So if we go back to the how the Chinese uh, name their places, uh, there are actually two components. Uh, so we have the prefix and the suffix. The prefix is the one is the specific, specific and the suffix is the generic. So for example, if we uh, take the word Dong Yang, so Yang is the ocean, so that's the generic. And then Dong East is the specific. So it means that Eastern Ocean. But here in Hai Dong, uh, Dong is the Dong is the generic and high is the specific. So it could mean to the uh, east of the sea. So this one should be, if, uh, in my translation, it should be uh, translated into remotely located at the eastern periphery of the ocean. Then there's also an uh, expression, Chi Ho Bei Ru. So it's, it means it's very hot. And the uh, character Ho means multiple times. So when Wang Daoyuan wrote this, he was comparing it to his place of origin, Chuanzhou. So it means it's very hot in compared to Chuanzhou. So it means it was in the tropics. And then the uh, if we go to the uh, order, how the countries were ordered in the Dawijilu, uh, Pishayu is in number 43. So if others would claim that it is in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan is number two. So one Chinese scholar said that uh, the, the order of the countries we're actually in relation to the distance of this country to China. So that's why it starts with Pangho because Pangho is the closest to China and then Liu Chou that is Taiwan. So there's no way that uh, Pishai could be in Taiwan or near, near that place because it's in the order, it's in number 43. And then there's also another Chinese scholar said that uh, you could actually plot the trade growth using the order of these uh, using the order of these countries. So if you look at the uh, illustration here, you can see like Pangho, Liuzhou, Mindoro, Mai. So that's the order here. That's one, two, three, four. 31, 35, 36, 46, 47, 48. And you can make a trade row from the order based on the table of contents of the book. So second, uh, the economic activities in Visayas. Um, so the first one is Shan Ping Kuang. So it means uh, the, the closest uh, literal translation to this is the one from Chen. This is the hills or the mountains are flat and deserted. So Kuang, so it could also mean that uh, the people at that time, the uh, Visayan people, uh, they neglected or they did not exploit the, up, the uplands or the hinterlands. And then there's the Tian De Shao Bu Duo Zhongzhi, uh, which means that the arable fields are small or the, and not much is grown. And then it means that the, the Visayan people during the time 
uh, we're only doing subsist subsistence farming. And then there says Di Wu Chu Chan, which means uh, the land does not produce anything. It could mean that uh, there were no precious minerals and metals that were found in that place. So interesting, uh, we have here the expression Lulu, and uh, the meaning of Lulu is to take prisoner and to plunder. And uh, actually, maritime, maritime ratings was not exclusive of the Visayan people, but uh, in each place that the maritime raids happened, uh, Wang Darian used different terms like in Long Yamen, in Singapore and in Lumbri, he used Jialu to take force and plunder or Kolu in Jangalo, Chelu to invade and plunder and Lulu to take prisoners and plunder. The exclusion of Bishai from China's trading network can be attributed to the negative reputation carried by the people of that place who were known for organizing maritime raids. Wang reported that the people in Eastern Oceans were scared and fled when they heard Bishai. However, it should be noted that that Wang cited in his book that maritime raids were not only prevalent in Pishai, but also in Vietnam, in Thailand, Jangalo in Eastern Java, Singapore Strait, Alambri in Sumatra. Noticeable, however, is the use of the specific terms for each of these places, which may indicate the manner raids were conducted. Surprisingly, the meaning Lu Lu is captured in the indigenous term Kayao, which originally denotes an intermittent ventures to places far away from one's own to take slaves and pillage for wealth. However, participants of Kayao were more interested in slaves since the purchase of slaves was an ordinary area for investing surplus, surplus wealth, according to Scott. Kayo was prevalent because the Visayans considered it a socially approved deed and its participants were conferred with social privileges and reserved rewards. So here's a description made by the author on how they um, how they capture their potential victims. So at times they packed dried provisions and row smaller boats towards faraway lands of outsiders. There they lie in ambush in wild mountains and search the valleys where no people lie, live permanently. When meeting with fishermen or forward gatherers, they suddenly grab them to bring them back to their own country and sell them into slavery. Each man sells for two tails of gold, hence the people from outside communicate them for release. Uh, also in Dao Jilu, the hairstyle was also mentioned. And uh, it's interesting that uh, in the book Dao Jilu, each country's hairstyle was, uh, was described. And there were four main or four hairstyles that were described there. So there was the Ya Ji, the Wan Ji, the Chu Chi, and the Tsu Chi. And uh, the description made by Diego de Arqueda somehow corresponds to what was written here. Both men and women suffer no hair to grow in their bodies except on their head. They wear their hair long and take good care of it so that it will grow. The men bind their hair on the crown of their head with a small piece of gauze, and the women bind it with bands made the, of their hair itself. So the hairstyle that was prevalent in Pishai was the Tsuji. 
Uh, this is very, this is important because according to the, according to the Chinese, uh, hair binding was a mark of adulthood and being civilized and uh, unbounded hair was the mark of a madman or a ghost. So when the author wrote that the Visayans, the bounded their hair, that means that they were already civilized at, the, at these times. Also described in this text is the, that are the tattoos and the pudung. It says that they use black sap and prick their bodies up to their necks, and they wind red silk around yellow cloth that they usually use to tie up. Next, the um, political situation in Pishaya. So there are only four characters, Kuo O Chiu Jiang. So Chiu Jiang is the paramount chief. So, and Wu is a negation. So it means that there was no paramount chief. So if there's no paramount chief, uh, if the supposed headman of this place is supposed to be a paramount chief, so it's not a state level polity. But then there was no paramount chief. So it also corresponds to the, um, one of the, descriptions made by one of the first Spanish colonizers. There are no kings or rulers worth of mention throughout this archipelago, but there were many chiefs who dominated these less powerful. As there are many without power, there was no security from the continual wars that were waged between them. So what we, can we learn from this text from Dawid Julu? It says that Visayas was not strategically located along the sailing route of the Chinese merchant ships, that the Visayans only practice subsistence farming. Uh, Visayas was not a producer of precious metals and rare mi minerals. Uh, there was a prevalence of maritime raid, or shall we say kidnapped for ransom in that area, uh, which scared of foreign traders. And there was no coherent political structure uniting the entirety of the Visayas. And the Visayas suffered from a case of bad reputation. That's why the Chinese merchants did not come to the Visayas. Now we go to the Ming period. Words published during the Song and Yuan periods did not provide specific information on the roads which connected the various overseas ports of coal. Significant details of the maritime road started to appear only in the 15th century with the expeditions of the court eunuchs. One of the crucial sources of Chinese trade roads during the Ming period was the so-called rotter, which illustrates the roads in words rather than graphic form. It usually follows the formula from place A, steer X degrees, after Y watches, you make place B. Interestingly, the Chinese compass directions are not designated with numbers, but with names. There are 24 points in the compass with 15 degrees intervals that bear names taken from the eight trigrams, 10 heavenly stems, or 24 earthly branches. The Chinese measurement of time is gong. This one gong, which is equivalent to 2.4 hours. Two known Ming writers describe various sea roads to the Philippines. Although these books were published in the 17th century, the talk argued that some elements were already orally transmitted long before they were, they appeared in printed forms. So this one is the Dongsi Yangka, and this one is the Eastern Trade Road. This book published in 1617 was written by Zhang Xie, a scholar who devoted his life to studying geography and history. The author draws his data from the information gathered from seafarers. The more sub substantial part of the book provides historical and geographical notes in various countries. The ninth Juan or chapter describes the sea road from China to various countries. It also includes a manual or navigation theory and practice. 
John followed the distinction between the Western and Eastern Ocean and elaborated the trunk roads to these two oceans and branches. So, so this was the road in the the one written in the Dong uh, Xiyang So it starts in Taiwu in China, goes to Pangho, to Kaohsiung, to Apari, and then to Ilocos, Pangasinan, up to Luzon, which is uh, Manila. Then it goes to Zhou Weishan, which is uh, said to be Cavite or Batangas. And then another road goes to Iningang, which is the Ilin Island near Mindoro. And it goes to Kuyu Island. And then there's another road that goes to Hansa, that's that is in Panay. Um, and it goes to Uton in Iloilo. And one uh, road goes to Haishan, then to Dapitan. And then it branches out to Jiao Yi, is a Kawit in Zamboanga. Jujima, that's Basilan, Magindanao, up to Ternate. And there's another from Lubang Island uh, to Palawan, Balabak Island, up to Brunei. So another book is the Shunfang Xiangsong, uh, which appear in a uh, which is kept in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. The character Shunfang Shangsong, which can be translated into English as May Fair Wind Accompany You, is the Chinese blessings for sailor, but has been designated as the title of the manuscript since it was published in 1961. While scholars do not come into agreement as to the date it was written, they seem to agree that the roads found in this manuscript were based on the knowledge acquired by the Chinese during the seven expeditions in the early 15th century. According to Mills, uh, the extant copy of the manuscript was written in 1620, but its content referred to the condition in 1430. Uh, Shen Fang Song includes a manual on navigational theory and practices, as well as mnemonics and prayers. There are 100 particular voyages recorded in the manuscript, and eight of them involve some places in the Philippines, which can be categorized in this manner. So there's from China to the Philippines, from Philippines to Southeast Asia, from China to Southeast Asia via Philippines, and from other Asian countries to the Philippines. As a destination for Chinese merchants, Cebu only appears in Jinan Zhangfa, which contains a manual on navigational theory and practice, as well as a detailed instructions of 53 particular voyages. Although the book was published during the Qing period, its contents refer to the conditions before 1607, and the recorded voyages may come from the 1471 to 1588 period. The road from Manila to Cebu in Jin and Changfa only listed the toponyms that sailors passed through on their way to Cebu and their return trip to Manila. After Genesis, sorry to interrupt. You have yeah. five, five minutes to wrap up the presentation. Okay. Well, what we just discussed is the how the Visayas was excluded from the uh, maritime trade. So now in the inclusion, the, in the initial exclusion of the Visayas from the Chinese trade network may have been related to the maritime trades conducted by the Visayans in Panghu Islands and on the coastal towns of the villages of Fujian and Guangdong, which were the provinces that engaged actively in the maritime trade with Southeast Asia. The Chinese people who survived the raids might have suffered deep traumatic experience and their stories reverberated down through the centuries. Even when China no longer faced a direct threat from the Visayan raiders, the Visayans still carried a bad reputation that even hearing their name 
could cause anxiety to Chinese merchants centuries later. It probably took ages before the Chinese would deem Visayas a safe place. To recall, Chinese merchants stopped in Mai during the Song period, and local traders distributed the foreign goods to other islands. Those who preferred not to deal directly with the chieftain of Mai went to other places but were still within the jurisdiction of Mai. When Mai's monopoly in inter-island trade was finally broken, Chinese merchants sailed to Sulu. However, they bypassed the Visayas for fear of financial loss due to the prevalence of maritime raids in the country. It was also not worth the risk to engage in trading in that area since the settlement there were reportedly unable to produce goods on commercial scale. If Chinese ceramics from the Song and Yuan periods ever reached Cebu, they were probably acquired through inter-island trading or maritime raids. With the ascent of the Ming Dynasty, other overseas private trading was prohibited and the flow of goods to and from China was regulated through the tribute system. While major politics of Luzon and Mindanao sent tribute missions to the Ming court, imperial records from this period never mention any polity from the Visayas. Chinese porcelains were possibly acquired through Thailand, given the fact that Shunfang Shangsong provides a trade road from Thailand to Manukan in Mindanao. The trade road network must have already been extended to the Visayas by the arrival of the Magellan expedition since Antonio Pigafetta recorded that a Siamese chunk disembarked in Cebu for four days before their arrival. Carl Eugen Guthi, the head of the Michel expedition, also observes a connection between Mindanao and Visayas with regard to trade with China. The general impression gained from the geographical distribution of the material and the specimen themselves is that the early Chinese commerce appears to have centered about a line drawn in a northeasterly direction along the western coast of Mindanao through the central Visayas towards the southern tip of Luzon. The link between the Visayas and Thailand would have not been possible with the role of the merchants from Borneo. Historian Manel Olay said, that early Spanish accounts points that it was the Bornean merchants who initially brought Visayan's products to Thailand, primarily cigar shells, which was used as currency in that country. Although the Visayas did not trade it directly with the merchants from China, it is possible that they engaged with Chinese-based overseas synologists uh, Papelitsky argues that the fact that a trade road between Thailand and the Philippines appeared in a Chinese source indicate that there must be Chinese involved in that network. And what attracted Chinese traders to Cebu, particularly during the Ming Dynasty, were its products, which were Cebu cow, cotton, and seaweeds. To end, the devastation in China caused by the maritime raiders from the Visayas had influenced the Chinese attitude towards the Visayas. Chinese merchants had avoided the central part of the Philippines for a long time. The process of inclusion of the Visayas into the Chinese trade network may have not been initiated by the Chinese traders from the mainland, but the Chinese diaspora in the southeast. Archaeologist Masao Nishimura proposes that Cebu, which is part of the Visayas, maintained multiple trade partners who took different trade routes. Interestingly, Thailand and Borneo had played a role in connecting the Visayas into the maritime Silk Road. Visayas acquired Chinese commodities through the Western Road via Thailand and through the Eastern Road via Borneo. The dynamics may have changed with the arrival of the Spaniards However, this is beyond the scope of this paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Genesis. I'm sure I'm not the only one who is very much impressed by your presentation with all the primary uh, data that you were able to actually analyze and put into um, 
uh, your presentation. Uh, and we already have a question here for you. Are you ready for your Q&A? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> thank you very much for that very interesting uh, um, presentation. So this is from an anonymous attendee. I read somewhere that there is an argument about Fischeye that a lot of them were white because one of them wrote Bai or white in his text. What's your opinion about this, Sir Genesis? Mm, I haven't uh, encountered any text that uh, telling them that they are white. Uh, what I read a while ago uh, when there was an accusation about the Cambodian ships that were uh, said to be of the Tukishaye, uh, mm -hmm. the officer said that uh, you have to see the color of the skin of the Tukishaye, they are black. No, so You're I'm black. sorry, I, I haven't seen any uh, material saying that they were white. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sir Genesis. Um, we're still waiting for other uh, questions from, from our participants. But I'm very curious about um, how many how many books in Chinese were you able to actually analyze uh, just to learn more about the Visayas within uh, this particular maritime trade network? Uh, actually, there are not many. I think four or five. Uh, the problem is uh, most of the discussion about Visayas are written in Chinese, so you have to go to the Chinese sources because uh, somehow the discussion about Bishaya has been politicized uh, by Taiwan. They want to claim that they, it belongs to them because, uh, you know, the conflict between uh, China and Taiwan and so th there are not many sources at, at this time, but many of the secondary sources, uh, many discussions are mostly written either by Taiwanese writers, uh, Chinese writers, and there are even some claims by Japanese scholars that the Pishai pe people are from Japan. So, I see. <laughs> yeah, but it's this is your presentation actually highlights. Um, the importance of um, scholars to actually know the language in order to access these information that are written by Taiwanese or by Chinese scholars themselves. So this is, I'm very much, I'm personally very much impressed of um, how you were able to um, navigate all of these uh, primary sources and uh, present this analysis. Uh when I was in Germany, I studied under uh, Professor Pitak. He's one of the leading scholars worldwide in uh, Asian maritime trade. So uh, every time we have class, uh, we read one text and then discuss. So that's the only thing we do. Uh, he gives us a text. Uh, and then the following week, we have to come back and then discuss that text. So. Uh, that's why I'm familiar with some of the texts uh, regarding uh, maritime trade in uh, Southeast Asia and China. And is this part of your uh, doctoral dissertation, Sir Genesis? Uh, actually, uh, I did not finish my <laughs> my PhD. So, sorry, uh, in the invitation, I think they put PhD in my name. So, uh, I think there was a misunderstanding there. So. Uh, uh, but still, at the moment, uh, there is a book actually which compiles all the reference about the Philippines in one book. Uh, but there's no English translation of it. So I'm, during my free time, I read it and then do a little bit of translation. But uh, I think it will take time because it's a 300 pages book. But uh, if you translate it, then it would uh value into thousand pages that's a that's a really huge uh work for you but it seems that you're very very much enjoying this as your passion project <laughs> yeah uh sort of a personal project because uh, i'm no longer in the academy so during my free time because uh 
if I don't do this, then I will lose my ability to read yeah. uh, the Chinese. So as much as possible, uh, I do something that uh, would make me get in touch with the Chinese. So sometimes so I a, say... Yeah, this is a very good um, sort of practice for you in learning Chinese. Yeah, because I, I'm still... I'm still learning no? because uh, it's it's very it's a difficult language, especially if you go to the classical Chinese because the grammar is totally different from the from Mandarin Chinese and uh, and the the original ones they don't have punctuation, so you have to decide uh, where to stop and what uh, images you have. So when, when I was studying classical Chinese, there were only two of us, and the other one was European and I'm Filipino. He was very good in grammar, and like 50% in classical Chinese has to do with imagination because you have to create images from what you read. So he could explain well with the grammar. I was not so good with the grammar, but I could... Uh, I can imagine what was written on the text, so it complemented when we when we studied together, the two of us. I see. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Sir Jobbers is actually um, asking, when will your book be published? <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Uh, are you going? To, are you going to publish this, Jobbers? <laughs> <laughs> Very soon, <laughs> can you send us? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm still uh, still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think all of us will be very much uh, looking forward to it, Sir Genesis. Um, I think we have another question for you, sir, um, from an anonymous attendee. Do you think Chu Fan Chu has an accurate hermeneutical analysis of the culture of Filipino people during the pre-colonial period? Uh, we have to understand that uh, those uh, scholars, they were bureaucrat scholars. So uh, during the imperial period of China, uh, you cannot enter into the bureaucracy unless you pass the civil civil service exam. And the civil service exam was about the Chinese classics. It's, mm -hmm. So you have to learn about the class classics, Confucius, and that's why most of the bureaucrat scholars, they have a Confucian uh, point of view. So so they describe those outside of China as the barbarians. So from the distinct, there, there is already a distinction between Chinese and barbarians. So, uh, and their description is always like uh, China centric. So they are more superior morally, intellectually compared to those barbarians. So you have, to, when you read these uh, books, you have to read it that, uh, that, the, that they are more superior. Mm -hmm. And probably the descriptions about the maritime raid in China that they eat people and yeah. What was that? Uh, it may not be true. Uh, they were just trying to portray that these are uh, animal-like people, that they are savages, but uh, they may not be actually true. Yeah, but that was a very controversial <laughs> claim uh, from the from those documents that you actually presented. All right, um, we have another uh, question over here uh, from Giovanni Putong. What was really then uh, the purpose or purposes why Chinese engaged in business aside of bartering goods? Do you think they want to influence Chinese goods for their advantage? Have you seen a primary document or legal manifesto coming from the domestic ruler in China to connect with other distant lands, such as uh, areas in Southeast Asia? Thank you. So, uh, what was the first? The, how many questions were there? Were there two questions? Yeah, this is three questions. Oh, three questions. So, what was the first question again? Yeah. What was the uh, what was really the purpose of Chinese uh, when they engaged in business aside 
from bartering goods? Uh, they only mean, uh, the Chinese only mean business. No? So yeah. uh, they wanted to supply the demands in in China. There was a growing demand for spices, for a lot of things in China because uh, they became richer there. So they want something more exotic. So that's why, uh, and as I mentioned in the first part, the imperial government they allowed Chinese to go and and buy foreign products and bring it to China, which was not possible earlier because they have to rely on the tribute system. So the tribute system is that foreign merchants come to China, they off they offer something to the they offer something to the to the emperor and the rest they sell it to the market. So if you under the tribute system, so China just wait until uh, some products would come to China. So if no, for example, no pepper would come to China, then you have to wait for another year until pepper would come to China. But this time, when the Song Dynasty allowed um, allowed the Chinese merchants to go abroad, so they can have pepper the whole year round because they have steady supply of uh, pepper, for example. So the second question, what was that? Um, I think uh, Giovanni is asking, did they do this sort of uh, like business to influence like other people to their advantage? No, I don't think so that they use this for their advantage. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and the third question is, have you seen primary documents or legal manifesto coming from the dynastical ruler in China to connect with other distant land? Like, uh, oh, there, there are plenty. Hmm. Uh, and before, um, uh, once uh, a century ago, most of the uh, most of the documents were translated by Western scholars. But now the Chinese themselves, they're producing more and more about these uh, trade net networks. Uh, I think three years ago, there was a three band uh, books just uh, about the trade routes, which I'm trying to acquire, but I haven't got it yet. So there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, books and a lot of conferences about uh, trading networks with China. Mm -hmm. All right. I hope, Giovanni, uh, that answer your questions, your three questions. And um, I think that's uh, the last question for you, Sir Genesis. Okay. Yeah, from the Q&A. All right. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> hope you were not bored. Of a <laughs> we're very much um, enlightened and very um, interested to learn more and read more about your work on these yeah. Chinese documents. We hope you be able to have more free time <laughs> and yeah. your uh, translation work. Yes. Thank you very much, Sir Genesis. Um, and that, yeah. And that ends our um, morning session, uh, panel A, with Dr. John Allen Peterson and Sir Genesis Velez. Thank you very much for your presentations, and we hope that all of you who attended this morning's uh, panel would be able to join us once again in the afternoon with Dr. Jobbers Reynes Versales and Dr. Ju uh, Earl Jude Cleope. So they will be, um, we will be back on uh, in the afternoon at 1 p.m. So you can stay in the Zoom perhaps. Uh, because I think uh, we will be still using the same link. So if you want to stick around, you can uh, stay here. Or you might want to uh, log out and enjoy your lunch uh, for before the, the panel in the afternoon. So thank you very much. And we hope to see you once again later this afternoon.